Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joining us online. It's great to have you with us. Um, as you all know, we are just one week away from Christmas, and I'm delighted to be welcoming you to this Christmas special, um, which has been arranged at a time when Christians around the world are about to celebrate Christmas. Um, this is a conversational um, dialogue, debate, presented by the South African Debate Initiative. My name is Dave Gilchrist, based out of Sydney, and I'm looking forward to moderating these discussions today. Um, our Christmas special is entitled God With Us, with a question mark uh, focused on Matthew 1, verses 20 to 25, um, presenting Christian and Muslim perspectives. So I'd like to start off by welcoming our speakers today. Let me begin on the Muslim side, starting with Yusuf Ismail, based in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. Good morning, Yusuf. Good morning, Dave. It's good to be here. It's and great good morning to, to all of you. Great to have you with us, Yusuf. Thanks for uh, for uh, putting aside a very early morning to join us. Uh, we also yes. like to welcome Dr. Shabir Ali, based in Toronto, Canada. Good evening, Shabir. Great to see you again. Good evening. Thank you so much. Good morning to you. <laughs> Excellent. We then move on to the Christian side. Um, I'd like to introduce, firstly, Reverend Samuel Green, based in Australia. Good afternoon, uh, Samuel. Hello, Dave and everyone. Great to be with you. And also a warm welcome to Rudolf Bosov, who's joining us from KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Good morning, Rudolf. Good morning. Good morning, Dave. Good to be with you guys. Let's move into just a quick overview in terms of the structure of our discussions today. So we're going to start off with the opening statements of 15 minutes each, firstly from Yusuf, then uh, Samuel. We'll then move into opening statements of 12 minutes each from Shabir and Rudolf. Uh, we'll then have a time of rebuttals, which will be um, 10 minutes each, firstly y Yusuf and then Samuel, followed by rebuttals of seven minutes each from Shabir and Rudolf. We'll then have a time of uh, cross-examination, which will be a 20-minute session, um, 10 minutes each. Firstly, Shabir and Yusuf asking Rudolf and Samuel questions, and then vice versa for the second uh, 10 minutes, um, before moving into closing statements of three minutes each. Uh, Yusuf would go first, and then Rudolf, and then finally, closing statements of four minutes each from Shabir and from Samuel. So before we get into the actual discussions themselves, I would love to just read the passage uh, from Matthew, uh, which is pertinent to the discussions today. So let's read uh, Matthew 1, verses 20 to 25. I'm reading that from the uh, NIV, starting at verse 20. But after Joseph had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. That ends the uh, short passage which we'll be focusing on today. Let's move straight into the discussions themselves. So we're going to begin with an opening statement of 15 minutes from Yusuf. Yusuf, over to you. Well, thank you, Dave, and thank you to my fine friends out there, and greetings of peace to everybody around the world. Um, let's start off with Matthew's Gospel. Matthew, and certainly as the passages quoted by Dave, and of course Luke, which was not quoted and cited, in fact, claim a virgin conception for Jesus, who they regard as a divine being but not God himself both Matthew and Luke state that Jesus well since we're discussing Matthew it states that Jesus was conceived by Holy Spirit not God the Father who thus is not logically 
the father of Jesus in the Trinitarian concept of the Godhead without the aid of a human father. Now, the point being made, how did the authors of Matthew and Luke, and indeed in this instance, Matthew, substantiate their claim? Well, they claim that Jesus' mother was a virgin at the time of the conception, and God, not Joseph, was his father, so he was really God's son from his conception. And that basically brings us back to the whole notion of begotting, begetting. What does it mean when you say um, God begets a son. Um, if you look, for example, at the uh, the citation given in Matthew one twenty three, behold, the virgin shall be with child, shall be a son, shall call his name Emmanuel. Um, and Matthew, in fact, uh, cites Isaiah chapter seven verse fourteen. The main point here is that when you look at the term Emmanuel, Emmanuel meaning God with us, Emmanuel. Uh, some would argue it's as if a, a kind of a prediction that God somehow or the other would dwell on earth in a thoroughly human body. And I would argue from a Jewish point of view, the Jewish understanding of Emmanuel, that that, that would be a fallacy. For example, if you look at Matthew's derivation of the term Emmanuel, that's the misuse, one could argue, of a statement in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 10. And so the point being is that following that, it is assumed based on Matthew's usage, that verse 14 foretells the miraculous conception of a person who is supposed to be God, the God-man in tangible human form. The problem is that when you look at the Jewish understanding, again, they never understood this in the sense that, um, you know, God's dwelling was to be in some form of a human form. You know, if you look at the word Shekaniah, Shekaniah in Ezra chapter 8, verse 3, and 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 21, um, there was no understanding of a human being in God in the, in the form of a human being. But here's the issue. Here are key concepts to the particular narrative is that if, if there was anybody out there who could have remembered the miraculous events surrounding the birth of Jesus, who would it be? It would be Mary and it would be Joseph, Joseph the carpenter. And according to Luke, you find a situation where later on, Mary finds Jesus in the temple teaching the teachers much later when he was 12 years old. And we are told that she scolds him uh, for, for causing so much trouble. And then he replies with certain questions. He says, why is it that you were looking for me? Do you not know that I must be concerned with the affairs of my father, God? If you look at Luke's gospel, although we're not dealing particularly with Luke's gospel, he adds that they did not understand, meaning his parents, the saying which he spoke to them. So Mary doesn't understand. Joseph doesn't understand. And the, the issue is that if Mary and Joseph were both visited by angels before their son's birth and there was a miraculous conception, how is it that they're so later completely surprised 12 years later? Does Mary, for example, not remember that Jesus was supernaturally conceived? And if a virgin conception took place, would it not follow through that uh, it would carry some form of implications for Mary as to who the identity of Jesus was? And the point being drawn from this is that it's quite clear that it's possible that the virgin conception, as is understood today by our good Christian friends, could be a later myth that was unknown to the earlier Christian communities. Other issue of contention is this, is that why only Matthew uses Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14? Because if you look at the usage of Matthew chapter 7 verse 14, uh, sorry, Matthew's usage of Isaiah 7 14, it's not found in Luke. Certainly John and Mark don't mention the birth narratives, but only Matthew and not Luke. And it, it shows that as scholars point out that this seems to be some sort of an afterthought an attempt to give biblical credence to a virgin conception and the subsequent birth narrative if you look at the description in matthew the alleged virgin you know conception isaiah's words uh, if you look at jewish texts have nothing to do with the conception of jesus whatsoever but matthew wanted to give some sort of biblical fortification to his virgin concept um, contention. So what he does is that he doesn't refer to the Hebrew, not surprisingly, and he refers to the Septuagint's rendering. So if you look, for example, at Matthew chapter 1, verse 24, there is the word, the behold, a virgin shall conceive. And the understanding there, the motivation is that there is a usage of the term parthenos, which in fact is a deliberate misuse of the Septuagint. Because if you look, for example, at Matthew's citation, that is taken from a Greek rendering of the Greek Septuagint. Matthew cites Isaiah 714 not as a Hebrew original, but as an intrinsic, uh, you know, proof text to substantiate his claim that the Messiah is to be conceived by a virgin uh, in accordance with the so-called prophetic plan. And he does this 
useful to him in that he uses a trans, the Septuagint's translation of Isaiah as Parthenos, which is somehow or the other understood as a virgin, as opposed to the term uh, Alma. Luke also thinks in terms of virgin conception, but he has no, he uses no scriptural basis for that. But Matthew, like Matthew's citation of 7 verse 14. But the point being made is that even the Jewish scriptures, even in the Greek rendition, even if they use the term Parthenos, they do not support the claim of a virgin conception. I'll give you explanations as to how. If you, for example, look at um, the Matthew's usage, the, the Hebrew word Isaiah, Alma, means young woman. It doesn't refer to a woman with any kind of sexual experience, but it, it does not mean virgin. It doesn't mean virgin. And so the evidence is that Alma simply means a young woman. There is a Hebrew word for virgin, which you gentlemen would obviously know, and that is the word Betula. Betula is not used by Isaiah. And um, it's a Septuagint which renders the Hebrew Alma, young woman, with the Greek word Parthenos, virgin. And that's how you have the term virgin being used. And the, the thing is, even if we were to presume a Hebrew original of the Gospel of Matthew, the question still rises that why was it the same as the later Greek text of the Gospel of Matthew? For example, if you look at the, I think it was Jonathan McClatchy in our first debate, he alluded to something along the line, if I recall clearly, that the Hebrew apparently used the uh, the word which would equate to virgin if there was a Hebrew gospel. But what was the basis for that? The other point is that did the author of the Hebrew gospel of Matthew in addressing the, Jew, the um, Jewish Christian audience, did he depend on the Septuagint's use of the word Parthenos to justify the virgin conception that developed amongst Christians later? And if the author of Matthew addressed a Hebrew audience without a dependency on the Septuagint, what would the word Alma originally have meant? This is the important question we need to look at. If you look at all the passages in the Old Testament where the word Alma is used, Genesis 24, 43, Exodus 2, 8, Isaiah 7, 14, uh, Psalm 68, 29, Proverbs 30, 19, Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 3, all of them um, translated as young woman. And it's only in Genesis chapter 24, verse 43, where, uh, and, uh, where, where the word Alma is translated in the Greek Septuagint as Parthenos. And it's understandable in, in Genesis 24, verse 43, because that basically is referencing Rebecca, who is, in fact, in other passages referred to as Betula. So the context obviously justifies the usage of Parthenos uh, in Genesis chapter 24, verse 43, as opposed to the Hebrew term Alma. But context dictates what the usage should be. And so what you have is a situation is that the quote from Isaiah 714 found in Matthew 124 follows a Septuagint rendering, but doesn't actually do so exactly. Because if you look at the Greek translation, the Greek translation gave Matthew an opportunity to exercise his kind of inclination to find some form of biblical basis for his claims. And what is significant is that it was not the biblical text, but a biblical translation that was used to support his theological assertions. That's quite important. You look at all the remaining passages where Alma is found in the Old Testament, it's always used as a young woman, a young woman who's sexually mature, a young woman could become a bride, and, and there's numerous passages in relation to that. If you look on the contrary, the masculine form of Alma, which is Ha-Elem, uh, you look at, for example, the reference to Saul referring to David, uh, uh, referring to David, he tells uh, Abner, you know, inquire from the young man, the high limb, uh, the lad, the two occurrences of the word, the context always indicates young man. There's no reference to um, virginity of any sort, but simply to age. In reference to Betula, it's a fact that the word Betula in the Hebrew word for virgin, it uses it consistently as virgin. Uh, the word Betula is found 50 times in the Jewish scriptures, and mostly all cases, we can always presume that the word Betula means virgin. Now, Matthew's use of, of Isaiah is based strictly on the Greek rendering of Parthenos, and the Greek text is not based on the literal Hebrew Alma found in verse 14, which says nothing concerning the virginity of the woman in question. The point is that if God wanted to make the point that the child was to be born um, of a virgin, then clearly there would be some sort of rendering in relation to that in Isaiah 7, 14, which is used as a scriptural text but by Matthew. But nothing is known of the young woman's state of virginity in Isaiah at the time that Isaiah spoke. 
nor is there any knowledge within Jewish exegetical literature or Jewish classical commentaries about the virginity of this particular woman. And even if in all occurrences of the word in the Jewish scriptures, it was proven that Alma was in fact virgin. There's no indication for that in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. So I don't want to delve too much on this particular issue. The other issue is this, is that could a virgin conception have served as a sign? Because in, all, in the Jewish scriptures, my understanding is, and the scholarly understanding has been, that a sign to be supernatural has always to be visible. So, for example, if you look at Genesis 1.14, the celestial sword of light uh, serves as a determination of the seasons, or where God gives Cain a sign so anyone who finds him will not kill him, or male circumcision as a sign of God's covenant. Sign has to be something visual. And um, the, the issue is that a sign concerning an impending evasion or for that particular matter, um, where God places a rainbow in the, in the sky as a sign in the case of Noah, that's something that is physical. But could, it could, could a virgin birth be a sign? Because uh, at most, this would only be known to Mary and Joseph, nobody else. Um, and Mary was already married to Joseph, according to the biblical narrative. The issue is this, is that it seems to me that this is an afterthought. The fulfillment that you find in Isaiah's times were directed toward his contemporaries. It would have absolutely no meaning for later generations. Um, all indications are that the sign was not the manner of conception, but the birth of a child that was to be naturally conceived. And there have been numerous references as to who that child was. Some would say that um, she's been identified, the, the woman's been identified with the, I think, the father of Ahaz. Um, in certain instances, there's been a proposal that the child is uh, Mahar Shalal uh, Hashbaz, born to Isaiah's wife with a child, Emmanuel. Um, there's no understanding of a virgin conception uh, that in terms of which there's a union. And so you have this union in terms of one third of the Godhead entered into union with the virgin so she could conceive and bear Jesus another third of the Godhead. This was not a, this was at no stage a Jewish conception or understanding of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. So the important question is, did, did God perform a miraculous virgin conception and birth and become flesh, a God-man? And in truth, the reality of the situation, there's never been a historical precedent of this in the Jewish scriptures. Now, Matt, uh, you know, Samuel or Rudolph may cite the Islamic point of view, but obviously that's a debatable point, and we can obviously cross that issue. We're dealing with specifically Christianity, Nowhere in the Jewish scriptures is a notion of a virgin conception to be found. Matthew and Luke, they claim a virgin conception for Jesus. Matthew, more specifically, he gives some sort of scriptural citation for it. But the scriptural citation that he gives is not justifiable because you have, for example, a misuse of the particular text. Why, why do we have a misusage of the text itself? And um, the important question that needs to be raised is that in all passages, if you look at, for example, the um, um, scriptural usage of Alma and the Greek Septuagint's usage of Parthenos, the point being made is that the, the Matthew takes liberty with the text. He uses, he exercises inclination to find biblical basis for claims that are not consistent with his. And that is supported by means of biblical um uh, translations that are used to support his theological assertions. Look at every single scriptural reference in terms of where the word young woman is used. It's always in the context of a young woman could be sexually mature, a young woman that could be a bride, Genesis 24, verse 43. Look at the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon's, where the word Alma is used. A young woman living or working in the king's palace in Proverbs, a young woman in a relationship with a man, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 19, or a young woman in a religious procession, uh, Proverbs chapter 68, verse 28. So the basic controversy revolving around the actual meaning of the word Alma, the use of the word in the Jewish scriptures leads to a conclusion that the word refers to a sexually mature young woman capable um, of, of having sexual intercourse without specifying whether she has had it or not, but in no way justifies the usage of a virgin. And so Matthew's uh, rendering of Isaiah in Matthew 1, uh, chapter 20 to 24 is totally misapplied. Um, and I leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yusuf.
Thanks for your opening statement. We're going to move straight into Samuel's opening statement of 15 minutes. Over to you, Samuel. And you're just on mute. Samuel, you're just on mute at the moment, so we can't hear you. Great. Okay. Um, if you can maybe uh, put my slideshow up, please. Sure. Samuel, I'm just struggling to get your slides up. Um, We've got it now. I can see it. Can you see it now? I see it now. It's clear. We can can't we, see you, the. Yeah, we can see it clearly. Great. Thank you. you. You may just you may just want to have me there. Anyway, I'll make a start. Now we've got that there. Um, well, welcome everyone today. It's great to be with you all at this Christmas time. Special welcome to Shabir and Yusuf as we uh, as we we think about Christmas from the Christian and Muslim perspective. Today we're particularly looking at Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 to 25, and we're looking at the, the events that are happening there and also their purpose. And I hope that whoever you are, that you'll find today to be uh, helpful in your understanding of Christmas. Now, what I want to do is to look at four points. I want to look at uh, how do we understand Christmas, uh, what the gospel proclaims, the gospel is confirmed and understood through the prophets, and God with us. So I'm going to get straight into these now for my 15 minutes. So let's go over here. Uh, my first point is, how do we understand Christmas? It's it's the story of Jesus. And when we look at Matthew, we see that he quotes the prophet Isaiah. And that actually helps us to understand that to understand Jesus, you need to listen to what the gospel says, and you need to look at the, the prophets. And this is one of the things that makes Christianity different to Islam is our books, because the Bible is not one book. It's a collection of many books from many prophets from the time of Moses right through to Jesus and his apostles. And so the, the Christian understanding of Christmas doesn't just come from one source. It comes from all the prophets who were before Jesus and also uh, the apostles of Jesus and Jesus' own life. And I hope that Muslims can understand how this is different to the Quran. The Quran is one man who um, tells you about the prophets. Muslims obviously believe he's telling you God's word, but it's still one man telling you about the prophets. And I just want to say that as we understand, uh, as we come to understand Christmas, that the way the, the gospel invites us is through the gospel testimonies and through the prophets. And so that's what I'm going to be presenting today. Now, what is it that the gospel actually proclaims? Well, Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 to 25 is a great summary of the Christian gospel. Let me just read to you from verse 21. He says there, sorry, I should turn my page there. should have had that ready. Um, he says there, verse 21, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And so Matthew chapter 1 and this section we're looking at actually tells us straight up and down that we need to be saved from our sins, that we're dead in our sins and we need saving, that we're unable to keep God's law. And it says in verse 23 that uh, that Jesus is going to do it. And it says that he is uh, the, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so what we have here is that we've got ourselves who are dead in sin and God is coming to save us. Just as God saved people at different times in the Old Testament, now it's God coming to save us himself through the person of Jesus. And so Jesus is given this name of God with us. And again, I want to encourage people to, to read the Gospels to, to see this for themselves. But Matthew chapter 1 is this great summary of the gospel for us. Now, one of the great things about this gospel message, about what God's doing for us at Christmas, is that it's confirmed in the earlier prophets. So, um, as I said, Matthew quotes from Isaiah, 
And so he says, to understand Jesus, you need to know the prophets who were before him. And when we go back to those prophets, we see that they universally say that we are dead in our sins and unable to save ourselves. So when God delivered Noah, uh, he, he waited and the whole world was corrupted. There was one righteous man, Noah, but even Noah, after the flood, sin continues through his family line. And so sin is a significant problem. Israel is given the law of God. They meet God themselves. They get the law of God. And yet sin continues even with those who have God's law. And it actually leads to Israel being judged through the Assyrians and through the Babylonian uh, exile to them. And so the, the whole Old Testament narrative and prophets say over and over again that we are dead in our sins. And it gives example after example after example of humans being unable to save themselves from God's wrath. And so what we find is that God says he is going to come and do what we have failed to do. So I'll give you a few references here. We've got Isaiah 40, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. So there's this announcement that God is coming. Uh, then I will make atonement for you uh, for all you have done. And you will remember and be ashamed and never again open your mouth because of your humiliation, declares the sovereign Lord. Now, that's Ezekiel saying that God is going to come and make a sacrifice of atonement for us to save us. And then, of course, in Malachi, behold, I send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So we have this idea that God is coming. This is just the message that God is coming to do what we have failed to do to bring about our salvation. Now, what's interesting is that in the book of Daniel, this focuses in on an individual. It says, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So here we see that there's going to be an individual who can approach God, someone who, who is worthy to come before God. And, and, and as we continue to read in chapter 7, uh, verse 27, when the dream is interpreted, this person is going to do it on behalf of God's people. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints. This is talking about God's people here. And so my point here is that when we read the Old Testament prophets, it confirms that we are dead in our sins and there's no amount of good works that we can do to save ourselves, that God is coming to affect our salvation. And when we look at Isaiah, sorry, in Daniel, we see that there's this son of man figure who is worthy to approach the throne of God and to receive the kingdom on behalf of God's people. Now, this confirms the Christian gospel message. And this is my point here, that Christians can have great confidence in the gospel because it's confirmed by the prophets who were before Jesus. Now, I'm going to have a quick look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. I'll look at this more uh, because that was Yusuf's main point was to look at this. So I'll just read out my notes quickly. Isaiah chapter, uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 is part of a vision which goes from chapter 7 to 11. And the whole thing is actually a messianic prophecy. It begins with Israel under judgment and ends with the coming of the Messiah in chapter 9 and in chapter 11. And the sign that is given that this is true, that this, this coming Messiah and what he's, do, what he's going to do is true, the sign that is given, the only sign, is the virgin or this, this young woman, this virgin, is going to have a child and this child is going to be the sign. Now, judgment came on the nation of Israel, but they were still waiting for the sign. So with the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, the sign that was given in Isaiah chapter 7 to 11, uh, uh, which was from the past, is now shown again. It had its fulfillment at its own time. But now that the Messiah has come, it's stated again. The sign is given again. And so it's fulfilled in the way that Matthew says. And as I said, I'm, I'm happy to come back to that. But the whole prophecy is a prophecy about the Messiah. 
the uh, the sign is of the virgin having a child. Uh, it's it's partially fulfilled in its own day, but the Messiah doesn't come. But with Jesus, who is the Messiah, it, that sign now comes to its fulfillment. And that's just how the prophecy works. I want to take a little step aside here to talk about Israel's history, because the history of Israel is actually prophetic. What we see happening with Israel and the events that God has in their life has an expression at that time, but it's also used by the prophets to understand the future. Now, this is from the Jewish translation of Zechariah. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men that are a sign. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the shoot. Now, this is Zechariah. It's the Old Testament talking about how the peoples of the Old Testament and their officers and, and the nation of Israel, really, are a, are a sign of how God has acted and how we're to understand how he acts in the future. And so we see this with the Exodus. In the Exodus, the first Exodus we see is actually with Abraham when he's, God calls him in chapter 12. And what happens? The first thing is he got, there's a famine. He goes into Egypt and then uh, he comes out of Egypt. His, his, his children are threatened in Egypt and he comes out with the wealth of Egypt. He has this Exodus event. We then see that repeated with the nation of Israel. There's a famine that drives them into the land of, of Egypt, and then they come out, their children are threatened, and then they come out of Egypt with the wealth of Egypt in an exodus. The prophets then pick that up, and they talk about, uh, particularly the prophet Isaiah, he talks about uh, how the, the, the problem of Israel's sin, and he talks about a future exodus to come, a future exodus in which God is going to save his people again. And then Jesus comes and he talks about fulfilling this exodus. Now, I just wanted to give that one exodus example because I wanted you to see how the events of the Old Testament, the, the, the events themselves are prophetic. And so this is what we see happening here where this, this sign of this woman having a child is not just a random sign, but it's a sign that speaks on its own. But once it's put into scripture, it's a sign that speaks to the future. And this is what we have in, um, in, in just the general way that the, the the whole of the prophets interpret themselves. I'll keep moving. Now, um, often Muslims will say that it's not reasonable to think that God could come to us as a man. We might look at this in a future debate, but in my last three minutes, I'll just quickly say, um, of course, God can come to us in, in this way because God is the creator and there's a connection between God and creation. He sustains us. So, of course, he can use this connection to come to us. God accommodates himself to his creation. And we see him doing this with Adam in the garden, coming to Abraham, coming to dwell with his people of Israel. God always comes to dwell with his people. We also see that humanity is made in the image of God. And so there's a correspondence and a connection there that God uses for the incarnation. And the, the point I want to bring now is, you know, if we think about God coming to us this way, what's the greatest view of God here? The Islamic view of God is that God is a, a great and exalted God, but he's locked up in his palace. He's locked up in, in, in heaven. Whereas in Christianity, God is the type of king who comes down and helps his people when they are in need. God comes down and dwells with his people and helps them when they are in need. And I actually think that's a, a greater understanding of God, not of a God who is remote and locked up and locked out of creation. So to finish up, how are we to understand uh, Christmas? I want to say we need to understand it from the testimony of Jesus' life that the apostles give us and from the prophets before Jesus who predicted these things and explained them to us. Matthew chapter 1 is a great summary of the gospel, and I really hope that this year, regardless of who you are, you'll come to understand what the gospel is and what God has done for you. Because this gospel is confirmed to us through the prophets. It is God coming to save us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's this gospel message that shows us the love of God and meets us in exactly our place. It meets us where we we know that we cannot keep God's law. We know that we're not worthy before God. And so God has done something for us. The, uh, God has come to save us. 
again, this is what the prophet said God would do for us, and it comes to its fulfillment in Jesus. And so to finish up, I just want to encourage you, if you haven't done so this Christmas, please get a Bible, open up. I recommend Matthew's Gospel. That's what we were looking at today. Look at the Gospel as recorded by the disciple Matthew and read about the life of Jesus for yourself. Read about Christmas for yourself there from the earliest documents on his life and keep on reading. Read all of it. Find out who this Jesus is and what he's done for you and how God has acted for you this Christmas. I'll finish there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Samuel. We're going to continue with uh, the opening statements and um, we'll move on to Shabir, who will have 12 minutes for uh, his opening statement. Shabir, we'll hand over to you. I'm not sure if you have um, slides ready or if you're able to go ahead without them. Let me see if I can uh, present from the slide. Um, so I'll go with share screen. And it looks like I cannot see the screen that I need to share. So let me just bring it up here. Okay, let me try one more time. Present, share screen. And this is the one, share. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. And it's a picture in picture. So um, we just need to get on to slideshow, I think, Dr. Shabir. Okay. Which will be uh, home it's... slideshow. What a... How about that? That's perfect. We can see okay. that. Fantastic. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, brothers and sisters, friends, um, thank you all for this uh, opportunity for us to share and uh, to discuss uh, our uh, various views. We're looking at Muslim and, and Christian perspectives uh, on the question, is Jesus God with us? I'll just try to start up my timer on my phone because the, the, um, the screen has taken up the entire... Um, um, the, the, the slideshow has taken up my entire screen, so my clock is uh, on and screen is hidden. Okay, so um, please pardon my voice. I'm a little bit under the weather today, but God will help us all. So the question is, is Jesus God with us? I begin by praising our creator and fashioner, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and asking him to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets, including Jesus and the prophet Muhammad. Ask him to bless us all tonight and help us uh, to come to a better understanding of each other, of our faiths, and uh, of uh, the salvation that God wants us to embrace uh, for uh, our eternal happiness. Uh, so to continue then, we want to look at Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 to 25 in more detail. Dave has already read it uh, before us, but I want to, as a segue into that, look at uh, how Muslims would perceive that from the point of view of the Quran. So how does Jesus get presented in the Quran, in particular, uh, Surah 3, verses 45 to 51? So there Jesus is the Messiah, verse 45, when the angel said, Mary, God gives you good news of a word from him, whose name will be the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. He will be highly distinguished in this world and the hereafter and brought near to God. He will speak to people from the cradle and when he is an old man. He is from among the righteous. That's the Quran as translated by Safi Kaskas. And, and I've obtained this from the website islamawaken.com. Verse 47 shows that Mary was a virgin at least till the time of the Annunciation. She said, Lord, how can I have a boy when no man has ever touched me? He said, God creates what he wills. When he decides a matter, he simply says to it be, and then it is. Uh, Jesus' miracles are de depicted in these verses, starting with verse 48. And he will teach him the book, the wisdom, the Torah, and the gospel. And he will be a messenger to the people of Israel, saying, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I will create a bird like for you uh, from clay and breathe into it. And by God's permission, it will be a bird. I, by God's permission, heal men born blind and lepers and give life to the dead. I will tell you what you may eat and uh, what you should store up in your houses. Uh, there is a sign in this for you, if you will believe. 
uh, what you should store in your houses. There is a sign in this for you, if you will believe. And the next verse shows uh, Jesus' confirmation of the Mosaic law. Verse 50, I will confirm what is available of the Torah, and I will make permission. I will make permissible for you some of the things that were forbidden to you. I have brought to you a sign from your Lord, so be mindful of God and obey me. And finally, Jesus' faithfulness to his God. Verse 51, God is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him. This is the straight path. So now, let's look at uh, questions that arise for Muslims uh, uh, from reading Matthew's uh, Gospel. Uh, is Jesus a child of the Holy Spirit? As Yusuf has pointed out, this is a question based on verse 20. What is conceived in her, according to that verse, is from the Holy Spirit. New Revised Standard Version, updated edition from BibleGateway.com. Did Jesus save his people from their sins? From verse 21, he will save his people from their sins. So did this happen, in fact? Uh, another question, is Jesus God with us? Uh, so the name Emmanuel, which means God with us, does that mean that Jesus was actually God and that he is with us? Uh, was it a virginal conception? Verse 24, he did not consummate their marriage until uh, she gave birth to a son. Uh, now, uh, Yusuf has uh, elaborated on this uh, in detail, uh, the question of, you know, the use of uh, Alma and Betula. Uh, Robert Miller, in his book, uh, Born Divine, um, has pointed out that in the ancient languages, there wasn't a word for virgin as we understand virgin today. And so uh, none of these words actually mean uh, virgin when they wanted to specify that it's a virgin. They would say, you know, a Parthenos who was, uh, you know, not touched by someone or something like this. So um, th there would be some further specification. The word by itself did not automatically mean virgin. So even if we take the um, Septuagin translation, we still don't have uh, mm -hmm. virgin in that passage, the way we understand virgin today. So... Nonetheless, uh, let's look at a, a related question. Did Matthew misapply uh, Isaiah 7, 14? Um, here I would uh, um, look at the context of that passage in Isaiah, where uh, two kings in northern Israel were threatening to invade the south. To resist the invasion, King Ahaz in the south wanted to align with pagan Assyria. But Isaiah warns him against aligning with the pagan power. Uh, and uh, looking further at the context, rather, Isaiah promises that the God of Israel will protect Judah from the invasion. The promise is that a young woman, presumably known to Ahaz and Isaiah, will soon have a son. Before the boy is old enough to distinguish right from wrong, God will vanquish the two kings in the north. Uh, looking further at Isaiah in context, uh, this was a prophecy about a near future battle. It was not a prophecy about Jesus to be born 700 years later. It would, uh, if it was such, then it would amount to uh, promising Ahaz that God will help him 700 years later, which would make little sense uh, at the time. But, but Matthew was using a Jewish interpretive method known as Pesher, where one looks at a current event and then one goes and reads that back into uh, the uh, ancient scriptures. So we don't do that today, that this would be called eisegesis. Uh, as opposed to exegesis. Instead of bringing the meaning out of the old text, it's like forcing a modern meaning into the old text. So Matthew did it. Uh, that was fine at the time, but we have to understand and respect the way that Matthew was uh, proceeding. As Robert Miller pointed out, uh, respect for these uh, authors mean, uh, means that we must uh, respect the methods that they used and the way that they were studying and quoting the previous uh, narratives. So there are two major concerns, uh, however, that I want to focus on a little bit more. One, was Jesus God with us? And uh, did he die for his uh, people? Uh, now, first question, is Jesus God with us? Uh, so is he God? And in what way is he uh, with us? So if we look more quite closely at the question, is Jesus God? That is related to the question, was Matthew a monotheist? Now, of course, one would assume that Matthew was a monotheist, but look at the two perspectives here, Christian and Muslim. For Christians, Matthew was a monotheist. Matthew said that Jesus was God with us. Uh, therefore, Jesus was God with us. Now, for Muslims, on the other hand, uh, at least for this Muslim, if Matthew was a monotheist, then he didn't mean that Jesus was God. For as a monotheist, he knew that there was only one God, the Father. Uh, 
If Matthew, on the other hand, believed that Jesus was God and that Jesus' father was God, then one cannot show that Matthew was a monotheist. I know this will strike many people as funny because uh, we, we tend to assume that Matthew is a monotheist, and I have, I have no doubt that he was, because in nowhere in Matthew do I find him actually proclaiming in any clear and unambiguous way that Jesus is God. Even in that passage, it's God with us, not simply God. Um, uh, but but uh, our Christian friends will say, but he means that Jesus is God and that he is with us. And I would say, no, if you say that, then uh, you, you really we don't know um, who the author of this gospel is. As um, Sheikh Hamadid used to quote uh, J.B. Phillips, the, the New Testament translator, as saying, we, we don't know uh, who is the author of this gospel. We just call him Matthew for convenience. So if you don't know who the author of the gospel is and you find him proclaiming the father as God and the son as, is God, uh, then it looks like he believes in two gods, if that's what you, you're saying that he's proclaiming. And you need the passage which says that these two are really one God. And you won't find that in Matthew. You might find it somewhere else. And on the presumption that the Holy Spirit is uh, uh, supervising the revelation of the entire Bible, yes, you will interpret one passage in light of another, and you will find a passage that God is one somewhere else, and you would try to make the two one. But uh, from Matthew alone, you wouldn't have that. So we couldn't even know that Matthew is a monotheist. So I think, as my last bullet point uh, um, uh, mentions, uh, Muslims and Christians should agree that Matthew was a monotheist and uh, that he never meant uh, to say that Jesus was God. Now, did Jesus die for anyone's uh, sins? And for Christians, Jesus died for the sins of uh, others. Uh, for Muslims, Jesus was innocent, and the innocent does not die for the sins of the guilty, as proclaimed in Ezekiel chapter 18, the entire chapter. Uh, the vicarious atonement, however, was later a later idea, mainly expounded by Paul in his writings. So coming to the end of my presentation, in what way is Jesus with us? For Christians, the spirit of Jesus lives in Christians. For Muslims, uh, the question arises, if the spirit of Jesus lives in you, is that along with the spirit of the Father and uh, the Holy Spirit? How do you distinguish among these three spirits? Jesus' teachings live on uh, with us in the teachings of the last of God's prophets, Muhammad, on whom be peace, uh, for Muslims. And by following Muhammad, we automatically follow Jesus. So here are some of the ways in which Jesus remains with us. Uh, we Muslims declare faith in one God as he did. We pray to God as he prayed to God. Uh, we fast as he fasted. And there are many other ways as well. So Muslims and Christians both believe in Jesus, though in different uh, ways. And uh, uh, finally, Muslims and Christians are all servants of God and we're all believers in Christ. Uh, so whereas uh, our Christian friends are getting ready to celebrate uh, Christmas, uh, Muslims generally do not celebrate the birthdays of the prophets. We believe in 124,000 prophets. So if uh, we were to celebrate uh, the uh, birthday of the prophets, we will be celebrating you know, on average, the uh, birthdays of hundreds of prophets each day. Some Muslims do celebrate the birthday of our Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace, but uh, Muslims generally do not celebrate the birthday of Jesus. But nonetheless, as I've shown from the Quran, Muslims uh, do and should uh, hold Jesus in high esteem and so to his mother. And uh, while we do not celebrate his birthday on a particular day, we celebrate his life in our lives uh, every day uh, to the even to simple um, extents. Uh, when a Muslim man grows his beard, he is actually following Jesus. And uh, when a, a, um, a family circumcises um, its newborn baby boy, uh, that is also uh, following Jesus, who, according to the Gospel of Luke, was circumcised on the eighth day. Uh, so, in short, uh, Muslims and Christians are both uh, uh, believers uh, in Christ and uh, servants of God. Uh, when I come back uh, for in the rebuttal phase, I will have a chance to look more closely at some of the things that um, Reverend Samuel uh, mentioned and uh, give my responses to that as well. In the meantime, I look forward to the presentation that uh, Rudolf will offer. And uh, I look back fondly with uh, upon the presentation that Yusuf has already uh, given as well and with appreciation for what Reverend Samuel has said. Thank you all and thank you, Dave, for hosting us. God be with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shabir. Uh, we will move on to Rudolf's uh, opening statement now, which is uh, 12 minutes. And so over to you, Rudolf. 
Well, thank you to all of you guys. I am really amazed. I think Samuel basically copied my presentation long time, <laughs> and that's all good and well. Um, but it's always good to discuss this, especially over Christmas period, and to especially look at what Matthew was trying to communicate. Now, before we get to what Matthew communicated, let me just quickly give you a preamble as to what we could expect in the Old Testament when it comes to the nature of the Messiah. Now, it's very interesting that when we look at the nature of the Messiah in the Old Testament, we see quite clearly that there is the indication given in Psalms 102, 25 to 27, uh, and a few other passages, for instance, of Proverbs 8, speaking of wisdom in chapter 22, uh, verse 22 to 23, that the one that will come as the Messiah will be eternal and from eternity, or he will be everlasting. And that is exactly the central theme that uh, the prophet Isaiah picks up on. A little bit later, we hear a lot about Isaiah 7.14, and we'll look at that. But we see in Isaiah 9.6, we see in Isaiah 48.16, quite clearly that the intention that is given is that there is an eternal Messiah that will come and roam upon the earth. Uh, this is obviously fulfilled uh, in the New Testament in, in passages like Colossians 1.17, uh, where it speaks of the eternality of the Messiah. In John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, uh, in John 8, uh, verse 58, uh, in John 17, verse 5, and Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, we can see quite clearly, and I don't just want to blur passages, that there is the expectation that is quite clearly given that the Messiah would be from eternity and he would be everlasting. Samuel mentioned this as well in his presentation, and I actually went into great detail. There is a wonderful um, uh, homily given by Eusebius of Caesarea in the 3rd century where he speaks about the reality of the promises in the Old Testament of God dwelling with his people. Uh, and that, I think, is sometimes marginalized in these conversations. And what we can see from passages like Zechariah chapter 8, verse 8, Genesis 6, 9, and all throughout the, the New Testament and Old Testament, uh, is that the authors all exclaim that at one set time, God will dwell with his people. Yeah. And there's a few other passages that we can look at um, just in rebuttal to Yusuf's presentation that uh, I will look at later. But what we see is the emphatic statement that God will dwell with his people and his arm uh, will reach into the nations and he will make himself emphatically known. That is again affirmed in passages like John chapter 1 verse 18. So coming from there, we can see quite clearly that there is a clear indication as to what the nature of God would be, uh, especially when he indwells the created order. Uh, and I think when we look at the four Gospels, there is a definite striking similarity in the way in which these Gospels present Jesus as being God with us. And for the sake of time, I can't go into all of it. But let me just say, when we look at the intention of Matthew, we can see for Matthew, Jesus' equality with God meant that Jesus is, like I said, and like the author of Matthew's Gospel says, God with us. And I think Samuel showed quite emphatically that he's personally and eternally present with his disciples. Uh, and it, it is just beautifully in, in a inclusio uh, when we look at Matthew chapter 1, 22 and 23, and then at the end of the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 28, 20, uh, and um, also in chapter 18, verse 20, we, we can see that Jesus makes it emphatic that he is God with his disciples. Uh, Jesus, uh, for instance, himself declares to his disciples uh, in Matthew 28, 20, that he is with them, uh, until the end of the age. Uh, in in, in uh, Matthew 18, 20, he speaks also, and he says, there were two or three are gathered in my name. I will be amongst them. So we can see that Matthew picks up on that central theme that is explicated in the Old Testament, and he makes it quite clear that what we can expect and what we can see is that God will be with his people. Uh, and I would even go as far as to say that when we look at that Jesus' very name, which is Emmanuel, God with us in, in chapter 1, verse 23 of Matthew's gospel, that uh, Matthew's got almost a, a very same thing going on as what we would see uh, when we read in John chapter 1, verse 1, and uh, one ch John chapter 1, verse 14, um, that there is an agreement even amongst these two direct disciples of Jesus as to the nature uh, of Jesus and that he was eternally with the Father, and he was now making his home with us. So the question on the virgin birth, how do we deal with that? Well, again, like I said, when we look at the virgin birth, there is something amiss in the Quran. Uh, we see that the virgin birth is in a sense affirmed 
but but the reason for the virgin birth is actually never described or never given to us and maybe that is something that we can investigate a little bit later but we can see quite clearly that both Matthew and Luke as Yusuf has mentioned uh, we can see quite clearly that there is the estimation given that there will be a virgin birth uh, and I agree uh, in the Hebrew word for Omar it refers uh, definitely to someone that is chaste, uh, definitely somebody that is untouched, uh, and we would we would call that a virgin. Uh, interestingly enough, in Genesis twenty four forty three, uh, we can see that Rebecca is again referred to with exactly the same word Alma, uh, and she's described therefore as being virgin, uh, virgin or chaste or untouched or being virtuous. Uh, the same in Exodus chapter two verse eight, uh, we can see that Moses' younger sister is described in those very terminologies. Uh, where she's described as being untouched, chaste, or what we would call a virgin. Uh, but the point is just very simply that uh, when when I look at the presentations of Dr. Ali, uh, when I look at Yusuf, one is totally saying that we, we cannot find the virgin birth in all of the New and Old Testament. And it amazes me because that is something that is affirmed in the Quran. It's not something uh, I think that, that Muslims need to stumble over. It's something that is... Uh, greatly explicated and, and held in regard in both of our systems of belief. Uh, but when we look at that, I think the important, important point is that Matthew had no doubt in his mind that, that Jesus was this God manifest in the flesh. Uh, and we can see that all through the book, uh, in five minutes, we can see quite clearly that there is the indication given that once more, Jesus does what God does. Um, for instance, uh, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, we can see that Jesus announces to the man, uh, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. Uh, Jesus declares his deity quite emphatically, um, you know, uh, when he is confronted head on uh, by Caiaphas, uh, and we can see quite clearly in Matthew 26, 63, uh, where Caiaphas adjures him and says, I, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us if thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, and um, Jesus announced that. He says, yes, he, he is that. Um, and, and he takes it even a little bit further in Matthew 26, 64, and he says, Thou said, nevertheless, you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. All of these indicate quite clearly what Matthew is trying to tell us. Uh, and Matthew is trying to tell us right through the book that this Jesus was not just a special Messiah, but he was more than just the Messiah. He was a divine Messiah. There's a wonderful depiction of that in Matthew 4, 3, where the tempter approaches Jesus and he says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus speaks directly to the tempter. And he says uh, to the tempter, uh, quite clearly later on in Matthew 4, verse 67, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Uh, and Jesus tells him directly, uh, do not teach the Lord your God. And after that, which the devil then goes away, which tells us that Jesus reveals something about his own nature. What about the disciples of Jesus? Well, in Matthew 16, 15 to 17, where Jesus speaks to his own disciples and he says to Simon Peter, uh, you know, who do men say I am? The disciple Peter announces quite emphatically, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. It's almost as if Matthew is trying to tell us that these two terms go together, that Jesus is both the affirmed Messiah, the one that is expected, and also the son of the living God. Now, if I listen to my counterparts' presentations today, I can say that they try to assume and deny these realities within the Old and New Testament. I say they are emphatically there, and Matthew, a Jew, recognizes these realities. Now, right through the Gospel of Matthew, we can see quite clearly that there are different instances in uh, the way in which Matthew uh, clearly announces uh, Jesus. For instance, uh, th though that during the great storm in Matthew chapter 14, 22 to 33, uh, we can see quite clearly when uh, Jesus uh, approaches them uh, and he calms the storm, uh, the words they are saying is truly, you are the son of God, truly, uh, you are the son of God. But, but the action after that is, um, you know, uh, is that, you know, they, they turn to him in, in worship and in reverence. Uh, they are quite amazed at his, uh, you know, his, his, his authority. Uh, not just that, Matthew also in uh, Matthew chapter 13, 41 to 42, where Jesus speaks of the, uh, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Jesus shows th that ultimately he is the one that will command the angels. Now, we know for absolutely sure that in the Old Testament, 
The prerogative of commanding angels is something that is only afforded to Yahweh. Uh, and in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6, uh, we can see that Yahweh even turns to Jesus uh, and he commands them to worship him in the highest, in the highest form uh, and in the most emphatic form. So Matthew is picking up on these central themes, showing quite clearly that Jesus is definitely more than just an ascended Messiah. Uh, he is more than that. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. According to Matthew chapter 12, verse 8, um, and interestingly enough, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 10 to 11, we can see that it is Yahweh that is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus speaks of himself in Matthew 21, 12 to 13 as the Lord of the temple. Well, we can see quite clearly that Jesus even speaks of the temple as his own house. Uh, that is all evident in Matthew's understanding of the Messiah. And we can go on and on and on where we see quite clearly that Jesus will be the judge of the nations, according to Matthew 25, 32 to 45. Uh, and here we can see quite clearly, and in my last minute, that Jesus makes it emphatic, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, that he is the expected Davidic king that will occupy the throne of that Davidic expectation forever. Now, the interesting thing is, is that when we look at the role of Christ right through the Gospel of Matthew, there's this interconnectedness and this communication as to what the Son will accomplish. And Samuel beautifully depicted that in the salvific work of Christ. But Christ does not just achieve the goal of the Father or of God, as we would say. He also makes sure to make us understand that in and of himself, he is that eternal salvation that is necessary for all men. And therefore, when the command is given, if, you, if this is a debatable point or not, in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, uh, to the disciples, that they should go and make disciples of all nations, uh, and they should baptize them in, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'll stop there. My time's up. Thanks very much, uh, Rudolf. Uh, we're going to move into the time of rebuttals now, which will be 10 minutes each from Yusuf and then uh, Samuel. Um, let me just start by checking, Yusuf, if uh, technology is on, yeah. on your side. Yeah. No, no, it isn't. As, as Rudolf was speaking, as you can see, I'm in total pitch utter darkness and there's a massive rain. So I kind of managed to join through my phone um, and obviously I won't be able to check the timer. Um, but uh, I, 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 if my sound is okay, we're good to go. But um, I'm not so sure how long I'll last. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm in darkness. So I've just basically got what I've got, and I'm, I'm limited to using this. So this is the best that I could do. Unfortunately, I've got no. We we totally we totally are. Our lights have just gone off completely right now. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll stick to what I've got now. That's okay. <laughs> Yeah, we can hear you fine, Yusuf. So um, you'd be happy. You're do, just welcome to. Go ahead. Okay. So do I have ten minutes? Would you be able to keep the time with me because I, I, I won't be able to um, check the time at all. I'm, I'm I'm working directly on my phone. Sure. Now I'll, I'll make sure I'm I'm checking the time of your ten minutes. I'll give you a one minute to go warning as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, three minutes, three minutes, and one minute. That'll be that'll be fine. That'll be helpful. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So we're good to go. Well, thank you, folks. Sorry for that technical glitch um, to the rest of you. I just want to deal with some of the issues raised by Rudolf and um, Samuel. The first point is the term Messiah, the, the Jewish understanding. And this is something that is acknowledged by all Jews is that the Messiah, there, there was the, the, the Messiah, the main the Hamashiach, but Messiah in a general sense has always been generic, someone that is anointed, someone that is appointed or consecrated to the position. I can't recall if, if um, Rudolf, in fact, referenced um, when he was referring to the Old Testament, Genesis 3.15, um, about the, 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 the general idea where, you know, enmity is put between the woman and the man and one will obviously, between your seed and her seed, he will strike your head, he will strike, you will strike his heel. And Christians take that verse to mean a miraculous birth took place. And the assumption is that the seed of this woman is not only the Messiah, but that conception took place without a human father. That's my understanding from Christian positions. Now, none of that is stated specifically or explicitly or even implicitly in the text of the verse. 
the Christian claim that the Messiah will not have a human father and will receive his kind of familial identity through adoption, that's totally unfounded. There's absolutely no reason to believe that um, Genesis 3.15, for example, is messianic or that the Messiah is to be born in a supernatural way. Um, you know, the phrase, the seed in Genesis, for example, has nothing to do with the messianic lineage. That woman is Eve and that seed that is representative of future descendants and the direct references to the hostility between mankind and the serpents, the, the, the Nakash. So there's nothing in relation to that. The other issue is that there's many messiahs in the Old Testament. For example, in Isaiah 45, 1 from recollection, Cyrus the pagan is viewed as a messiah the anointed one, the Moshiach, and with his right hand, God will subdue nations. Now, here you've got a pagan, Cyrus, who is a pagan king, uh, and he's viewed as a messiah. David and Solomon, they are also viewed as messiahs. So there was nothing intrinsically special or unique in terms of the usage of the term messiah, the anointed one, the designated individual in relation to that. And so when applied to Jesus, a, a Christians somehow or the other make the point or want to make the assumption that Messiah is a unique designation. And I see this more often than not in uh, debates and polemics that they sometimes cite the Quran's usage of the Messiah as being a unique designation, simply only applying to Jesus. And based on that, somehow or the other in missionary tautology, this somehow gives the indication that Jesus is somehow unique creation or characteristic or God for that particular matter, which is a poor argument in any event. So Messiah is nothing unique. Um, the, the, the other issue is that um, Sam, uh, Rudolph makes the point that the reason for the virgin birth is not given. And my argument and the argument of many Jewish scholars is that that this was not the, the reason is that the virgin birth, the, the reason for the virgin birth is not given is because it was not supposed to be a sign. A sign by its nature, a miracle by its nature, had to be visual, had to be something that could be seen. A virgin conception or a virgin birth couldn't qualify. If you look at both the Hebrew text and the Septuagint translation, the sign in the text was not the manner in which the child would be conceived, but the precise timing uh, where the child, the Emmanuel, would serve as God's presence and protection. And Shabir pointed this out quite clearly in the in his slide presentation. And so neither the Hebrew nor the Greek of Isaiah 7.14 referred to a virgin conception. And there is nothing in the biblical understanding of Isaiah 7.14, because let's look at this. Isaiah 7.14 is the is a text, is a biblical scriptural justification for something that allegedly happened. But the problem is there's nothing in the biblical understanding of Isaiah 714 to base the belief in the virgin conception of Jesus. You can only do it by mistranslation, which, well, Matthew probably done in reference to the Septuagint. But it's, it's a claim stated in the Gospels of Matthew, but not at all in Isaiah. And at most, you find a situation that Isaiah 714 was used to give biblical expression to an already existing Christian belief in the virgin conception of Jesus, which developed at a far later time and not something that was existent at that particular point. I mean, the issue is that even for the sake of argument that there was supposedly a virgin conception, shouldn't Mary have known of that? Should shouldn't Joseph have known of that? And yet, why do they express some degree of surprise and, 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 and horror and shock when, and, 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 and reprimand him when Jesus is teaching the elders in, at, at the age of 12? Surely they should have known that this is something that was special and something that was essentially unique about him. So there was nothing unique in him teaching them. And yet they censure him. They, their behavior and their conduct towards him is not somehow the other one of, for example, an expectation and uh, of some sort of, 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 of surprise or they, 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 they give some sort of surprise and some sort of shock. Uh, then Samuel basically focuses on the issue of the atonement. Um, but the one thing, and he cites the Old Testament in relation to that, and I think gen generally Christians use Leviticus, but offering sacrifice is only one part and a small part of the temple process of atonement because you somehow cite the Old Testament view of sacrifice and then you point out Jesus as the eternal sacrifice. Sins were not automatically removed when an animal was slaughtered on the altar as if something took place that made the individual's own moral actions irrelevant. The sacrifice symbolically connected the worshiper to God and therefore it provided the kind of external basis for an effective repentance, but there still needed to be an internal repentance. Sacrifice 
animal sacrifice in the Old Testament was not an alternative to contrite repentance. There had to be sincere, confessionary, repentant prayer that must always accompany the atonement, even if with a blood sacrifice offering. So atonement is not granted to the sinner by virtue of the sacrifice alone. The confession of sin is an essential part of repentance. So if you want to cite the Old Testament sacrifice, even when the Torah mandates a specific offering of sacrifice, there cannot be an atonement without an oral confession. As long as a person refuses to acknowledge his wrongdoing, he cannot sincerely said to be repent. So sin cannot be erased by the mere observance of a technical rite of blood sacrifice. The penitent sinner must perceive the sacrifice as if he was offering himself as a victim on the altar. But the true atonement lies in what Psalms, the book of Psalms would say, a contrite heart, a broken spirit. The, the sinner must face the gravity of his guilt and act upon that to relieve his own burden. So Ezekiel 18, 20 says, the soul that sins, it shall die, but the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. Um, if the, and if the wicked shall turn and do all that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. I mean, Jesus himself says that, um, think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophet. Three minutes, Three minutes. okay. Three I come minutes. not to destroy, but to fulfill. Um, for verily I say unto you that heaven and earth shall pass whosoever, uh, and he goes on to say, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no heaven for you unless you are, in a manner of speaking, better than the Jew. But how can you be better than the Jew if you not at the very least keep the laws and the commandments? Go just simply beyond just simply fulfilling the letter of the law and forgetting the spirit. So you go the extra mile. So... The, and, you know, Solomon, I think he gives the wide admonition to his son. He says, further by this, my son, uh, be admonished of, of make of writing many books. There's uh, there's no end and much studies weariness of the flesh. Come, let, let us come to the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. So why would Jesus break that? That, that 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 principle in relation to that lastly at no time was isaiah 7 14 considered by jewish sources to mean the messiah would be born of a virgin if you look at the second century debate between justin martin and trifo over the meaning of the interpretation trifo the jew takes a position that alma means a young woman and that the promised child was hezekiah in the new testament only matthew and Luke contained these virgin uh, conception stories and genealogies. Alma conceiving and giving birth is not unusual. If on the other hand, the virgin conception was the sign given by Isaiah, then the child's mother would be the one person who would be positive that it was really a virgin conception. And yet there's nothing in the uh, New Testament where Mary expresses any degree of subsequent surprise in relation to that uh, at a much uh, later time. So... The, the, the issue is this at the end of the day, that if indeed this was such an important part uh, in, in Matthew 18, 20, and um, in fact, um, if God performed this virgin conception and birth and became flesh and God man, then why is it that this notion is totally absent in the Jewish scriptures? And why is it that um, this idea... Uh, this idea had to be justified much later. And the reason quite clearly is that the idea of divinity incarnate was widespread in the ancient pagan world. And so, you know, they imagine, for example, that that God not only, for example, or gods could perform the miracle of virgin conceptions, but, you know, the process, a part of him being the human being was something which was so easily conceived. And based on that and based on the idea of the development that occurred um, much later in Christianity, you had a situation whereby this was then justified and used uh, by Matthew. In most, at most, Isaiah 714 was used to give biblical expression to an already existing um, Christian belief in the virgin conception of Jesus, not the other way around. It was like I think Dr. Shabir and others have mentioned, uh, you know, proof after justification after the fact or or proof after the fact. In other words, you have something which you develop as a so-called illusion to something that never took place, and then you justify that much later. But there's no justification for that in Scripture, and so I would say that this is a total misapplication. In, in, in fact, the, 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 the miracle is not the miracle is how Matthew misapplies Isaiah chapter seven fourteen to prove a particular theological point, which is not found in in, in um, Mark's gospel and is not found in John's gospel. And I leave it at that. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, uh, Yusuf. 
we're going to move on to um, Samuel's rebuttal of 10 minutes. Over to you, Samuel. Thank you, Yusuf and Shabir, for your presentations. I'll get straight into replying to uh, some of the points there. Now, Yusuf, I, I need you to clarify for us, and we might bring this up in the cross-examination. You spoke about the virgin birth being a myth that developed in your presentation, your first one. Um, now, my understanding, and I know that it's there, is that the Quran also has the virgin birth. And so I just, I, I guess, language like myth and all that regarding the virgin birth doesn't really seem to fit. And I'd be keen to hear where you go there because you seem to be denying uh, your own faith at that point. Um, now, regarding uh, some of the other points, you said that uh, how could a virgin birth, uh, which is a private thing, be a sign? Well, again, the, the Quran puts forward Mary and Jesus and Jesus' birth this way as a sign. So you seem to be denying your own scriptures there. And it is a sign in that it's written up in scripture and becomes proclaimed and told. And so in that sense, it becomes a sign. You asked about how could Jesus' parents have had this experience and then not understand why Jesus was in the temple? Well, again, this is where I'd encourage them to read the, the gospel for themselves, because in Luke, it actually says that what annoyed them, what shocked them was that he left them, that that already started to go back up to, Jeru uh, to Galilee or Nazareth. That started to go up to the north and it was three days till they found out that Jesus was gone. And so they weren't shocked that he was in the temple. They were shocked that he wasn't there and that he hadn't told them. And so that that's what sort of shocked them. It, that, that was the, the, the part there. So the Bible answers that for us. Now, I just want to talk about, uh, you're saying that Jesus, uh, sorry, for the Jews, they did not have this idea of a virgin birth. Uh, associated with it, I want to say that sort of yes and no, yes and no, because the Jews absolutely had an idea of special births. They absolutely had the, the idea of a miraculous birth. And so we see this with Sarah, where Sarah is unable to conceive and uh, she's very old in her age and she's miraculously able to give a ch have a child. Um, we see this with uh, with Samson's parents as well. His wife can't have a child, and she does. We see this with John the Baptist as well. So there's actually a, a long history here of, and there are other women as well, where, where uh, when God does a new work, there's some miraculous birth involved. And so the virgin birth of Jesus actually just fits perfectly in with what we see in the Old Testament. It's a level higher than what we see. It's not someone who can't conceive it's a new and glorious expression of it, but it's completely consistent with it. And in this case, uh, it's, it's for the, the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so it's in its fulfillment form. And so it's in a way that we haven't seen before, but is in uh, complete conformity with it. Um, you're also saying that the Jews didn't expect God to come as a man. Now, this has sort of been brought up uh, already, but... And you've, you're suggesting in your rebuttal that this is, you know, a Greek idea of the gods becoming men. Well, it's it, it may be a Greek idea. The Greeks may have had their own idea there. Generally, the Greek philosophical idea was that God cannot touch creation. And so that's what the Christians had to deal with. They, they didn't have to deal with the idea that God can become a man, but it was that God can't become a man uh, because of Greek thinking. But in Greek myth, that would have been the case. But within the Old Testament scriptures... It is clear that God dwelt with Adam in the garden and walked with Adam in the garden. God came and uh, met with Abraham in Genesis 14. In Exodus 25, verse 8, God comes, and in the book of Exodus, God comes and dwells personally with his people in the tabernacle. And uh, the prophet Ezekiel, when he sees the vision, he talks about God's resurrection temple, the temple of the resurrection age. And so the idea of God dwelling with these people is a thoroughly consistent Jewish idea. It's all the way through the prophets from the beginning to the end. And so when we say that God's come to dwell with us in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is a new and beautiful expression 
of a, 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 a of a consistent and well-established biblical idea of uh, idea of the earlier prophets. Now, what have I got over here? Um, now, you spoke about the, uh, the the word Messiah being a general term, and it's not specific to Jesus. And you spoke uh, you, about Cyrus being called a Messiah in the book of uh, uh, in the book of Isaiah, and also you mentioned how David and Saul are also called mess messiahs. And, and this is true, but that doesn't mean it's not special. You said it, it's nothing special because what makes a particular expression of the word Messiah special is that it's connected to the covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that God makes with the King David. And he says to David that David's son will build the temple. That is, he's going to build the place where God and man meet. David's son's going to build the temple where God and man meet, and he's going to rule over God's kingdom forever. And so there's this idea that, th that there will be a particular messianic king who brings the rule of God on God's behalf, that he brings God, he brings God and humanity together in the temple. And as we continue to read the prophets, we see he's going to rule over the eternal kingdom, that is the resurrection kingdom. So there is content to to this word messiah he's the son of david he's going to um he brings the rule of god he brings god and humanity together in the temple and he's going to rule uh, forever in the resurrection age so it is a special title it is a special title you also mentioned that uh and it was great to see that you acknowledge that the idea of atonement is there in the old testament which it is it's it's a significant theme throughout the old testament uh, the word means to turn aside the wrath of God. And there are multiple examples where the sacrifice of atonement turns aside God's wrath. Now, you, you, you pointed out that, but they also had to repent and confess their sins. Now, we fully accept that. We fully accept that. You cannot go and uh, just sacrifice uh, a sacrifice of atonement and accept uh, and expect that that's going to take away your sins without genuine repentance you know the two go together but the two go together that's the point in islam the sacrifice of atonement is is lost because it has no temple theology and instead it's you're just left with if you repent that's enough but as i've pointed out uh we can't repent we, we, we don't worship god we don't keep god's law and this is why god has come to us to save us and so we need saving now of course the sacrifice of atonement needs to be accompanied by repentance and faith. Uh, we're not denying that, but you, you can't separate them either. You can't just say, therefore, we don't need the atonement. Uh, a reference to that was you gave was in Ezekiel 18, but I quoted from Ezekiel 16, and Ezekiel 16 says that God is going to come and offer sacrifice of atonement on our behalf. And so uh, Ezekiel 18, which as Christians we all agree with, says that you've actually got to genuinely repent and you know come to this sacrifice and, and this atonement that God is bringing. Now, I may have some time here. What have I got? One and a half minutes left. Um, I might just have a, a quick look at Shabir's, uh, Dr. Shabir's statements. He was saying that Matthew takes a current event and then reads it back into the ancient text. And this is eisegesis. I, I guess I want to say yes and no. It was Jesus himself who said that he's come to fulfill the Old Testament. And so Jesus says to us, go and read the Old Testament if you want to understand me. Now, that doesn't mean eisegesis. It, it means reading the Old Testament to see how it's prepared us for the categories, for the prophecies, for our understanding, for the covenants, so that we can understand who the Messiah is. Once we understand that Jesus is the Messiah through his resurrection from the dead, we then need to go back into the Old Testament to look at the, the categories and the, the instruction that it gives us so we can understand who Jesus is. And I did that in my talk. So it, it's not just reading stuff into the text. It's actually the, the text is providing the concepts for us. Um, now, what have I got here? I'll just finish with this last point here. Uh, Shabir said that the Quran uh, preserves the teaching of Jesus. It actually preserves none of the teaching of Jesus. Jesus spoke in parables and there's a whole range of teaching. The, the Quran actually, one of its characteristics is it has not, none of Jesus' teaching. There are none of his parables. 
It has a couple of sentences about his miracles, but overall, uh, words are just put into Jesus' mouth to, to say things like, uh, as I pointed out uh, in Surah 9, verse 111, that people get into paradise through, uh, through jihadist military action, which, of course, is not Jesus' teaching. So the Quran doesn't keep the teaching of Jesus. Um, it, 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 Jesus is, the name of Jesus is used there. But I'll finish up there. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Samuel. We will continue with the rebuttals um, and we'll move into Shabir's rebuttal, which will be for seven minutes. So over to you, Dr. Shabir. Uh, Shab you're on mute, uh, Dr. Shabir. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Samuel, for that excellent uh, engagement with my um, points and Rudolph as well. And thank you, uh, Yusuf, for saying many of the things which I would have said myself. You said it in a better way. Uh, so. I'll pick up uh, where uh, Samuel left off. Uh, Surah 9, verse 111, yeah, speaks about something that is mentioned in the gospel, and the word there is jihad, but uh, Samuel wants to make that mean something like, uh, you know, killing, killing innocent people. But uh, we know that uh, both the New Testament uh, and uh, Christian scholars over the ages have worked out a just war theory, and I would argue that the Quran, when it does speak of war, it's speaking about war within the context of a just war uh, theory. And as for Jesus' presentation in the Quran, he's presented as entirely peaceful so that Jesus can say, In the 19th chapter of the Quran, peace be upon me the day I was born, the day I shall die, and the day I shall be raised up uh, alive. So uh, Jesus is all about peace in the Quran, whereas in the Gospels and in the New Testament in general, uh, Jesus uh, is presented as the Davidic Messiah, who by definition is going to be the one who violently overthrows the Roman rule. Of course, he didn't do it. And uh, John, writing uh, much later after the fact, uh, wants to change the story to have it that Jesus' uh, kingdom is not of this world. And that's what he declares in front of Pilate. But even so, the book of Revelation in the New Testament shows that when Jesus comes back, he will be uh, uh, violent with a sword coming out of his mouth. Although that is symbolic, uh, but uh, it's symbolic of the uh, whole idea that Jesus is going to demolish his enemies uh, as is detailed in the book of uh, Revelation. So looking at uh, Peshur, which is eisegesis, uh, Samuel says, well, Jesus himself said that he came to fulfill. But who told you that Jesus said that? It is Matthew himself. Matthew who told you that Jesus said that I came not to uh, abolish but to fulfill. And Matthew 14 times in his gospel says Jesus did this in order to fulfill that. Five times he does it, uh, Matthew does this in the first two chapters. And in these two chapters, that's what we're discussing, this passage about Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, which I've shown that Matthew has uh, utilized pressure uh, to make uh, Jesus' life correspond to what is there in, in Isaiah 7, 14, even though it had nothing to do with uh, a future birth 700 years later. In the same vein, we might add that Jesus said that when Je uh, uh, Matthew says that when Jesus and his family went to live in Nazareth, that's to fulfill what was written that he will be called a Nazarene. And nobody knows exactly what Matthew was referring to. Maybe he was referring to Isaiah 11, where it speaks about the nets or a branch, uh, but that's hardly Nazarene. Nazarene. Uh, referring to a place where where Jesus would live. But Matthew makes it that because he's obsessed with uh, making things work out like this, even when obviously they do not work out. Um, uh, Samuel says, but Muslim has no temple theology. That's why we can't, uh, you know, have a proper understanding of uh, how the atonement gets uh, rid of the sins. And he admitted that in the Old Testament, atonement did get rid of sins so long as there is a genuine repentance. But then that raises the question, if there was genuine repentance and people got rid of their sins, uh, why do you need Jesus to come and die for the sins of the world? Because it would mean that people in the Old Testament were already forgiven many a time. And Jesus comes to die for the entire world. His blood is apparently so precious that it's good for the entire world. Uh, all people from the past and the future. So then if that one death is sufficient for all of those people, and if their sins were already paid for, and now Jesus comes and pays for the sins all over again, that isn't the sin paid for twice. And doesn't that make God appear to be unjust for exacting the penalty twice for the same sin? Uh, do we in our modern states uh, uh, cruci crucify a, a man twice for the same uh, uh, sin? Um 
so he, he, a lot of what has been discussed, uh, I find, uh, is with the assumption that Jesus is God, and somehow there is a uh, an attempt to make Jesus, uh, you know, make any passage mean that Jesus is God, even when the passages clearly uh, do not uh, seem to indicate that. Um, so, uh, for example, Samuel is talking about miracle births, and he showed that so many miracle births are there in the Old Testament. Well, the miracle birth does not make the, the man a, a, a god. Um, and why should it be in the case of Jesus? This would be splash, special pleading. If he is born miraculously, that's God's power. Muslims have this right in saying that God made this happen in that way and this is the power of God not the power of Jesus himself uh Samuel says what you know the in the Old Testament they did expect um that God could come anytime but notice that the references that Samuel is giving is of God appearing as a human being it's not as God becoming a human being you see Christian theology has it that Jesus was both God and man at the same time and this is the internal contradiction because to be God means he's unlimited to be man he is limited you cannot be God and man at the same time now Christians say that God dwells in them but so we don't say this is a contradiction we might ask you do you are you really sure that God is in you or you know how do you know what's in you but uh, that, that is not the contradiction. So if God dwelt in Jesus, as some passage of the New Testament says, well, that, there is a distinction between God, who is dwelling in Jesus, and Jesus, in whom God is dwelling. And this language is so clear that it is so puzzling to me that our Christian friends, intelligent uh, persons who discuss with us, uh, would not see that when they're, if they listen to themselves, they're, they're saying God. And when they say God, that obviously refers to someone other than Jesus. So when they say God dwelt in Jesus, as Samuel puts it, he says that Christians say, and I tried to type it as quickly as he was saying it, but I'm not so quick as a typer. So I got it uh, as a typist. So I got it uh, as close to, uh, in close approximation. He said something like this. He said that Christians say that God dwelt with us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, then in that very statement, someone is called God and someone else is called Jesus Christ. One is dwelling in the other. So uh, listen to yourselves, my friends, and, and you will hear that, that when you speak of God, it is actually someone else. So Samuel says, uh, well, God for Muslims is locked up in heaven. Well, both Muslims and Christians agree that there are certain things which... Um, you know, is unbecoming of God. So we don't attribute those things to God. For example, God doesn't have a wife. That's not a limitation. That's just in God's nature. So someone might say, well, your God has never had a, a, a you say God is love. Well, he, he doesn't experience all kinds of love uh, because there's a love between husband and wife that he has not experienced. Um, so we don't say that God is locked up in heaven, uh, just as we wouldn't say, well, okay, there's a limitation on God because he doesn't experience this type of love. Um, and so we say some things are not in the nature of God and we leave that alone but we affirm that there is only one God the one who sent Jesus Christ as the Messiah thank you all very much thanks very much Dr Shabir we're going to finish off the time of rebuttals with um final rebuttal mm -hmm. from Rudolf for seven minutes so over to you Rudolf well, thank you so much, uh, you guys. This is such an interesting topic of discussion. Uh, Samuel already covered some of the points, so I'm going to try to pick those that he did not cover. So uh, in Jesus' expectation and in his presentation, he said that no expectation was given in the Old Testament that God in any way or form would become man. Uh, but that is simply not true. You can read a passage of Scripture like, for instance, in Job chapter 19, 25 to 27, where we see quite clearly that uh, even Job himself prophesies and speaks quite clearly that his Redeemer, uh, who we obviously speak of in Matthew chapter 1, 20 to 23, will be physically seen upon this earth. He even goes far as to say that uh, I will see my God in the flesh. I will see him myself. So there is some expectation. And if uh, you want to, uh, we can maybe in future discussions look at some of the early expectations in the Old Testament where God would actually indwell his own creation. Uh, again, that is something that is clearly evident in Job chapter 19. Uh, again, we heard it said that, uh, you know, that when we look at uh, the use of Matthew in Isaiah chapter uh, 7 verse 14, uh, Matthew is just merely used, uh, utilizing an interpretation of pressure uh, in reading into the past. Uh, well, Matthew Bates um, uh, recently wrote a book, uh, and in it he speaks of prosperological exegesis. Now, that's just not just a clever word, 
but he speaks of the way in which the Old Testament authors would utilize the Old Testament and well, the New Testament authors will use the Old Testament passages and integrate it to explain emphatic points uh, as to what was fulfilled by the Messiah. Uh, and he would say that there is no violation of them reading Christ into those texts because those texts promise the coming of the Messiah, which they now recognize. So there is not a uh, prophecy given at Evento, which we, for instance, see that they're trying to read Christ into the text. They're rather showing that Christ had fulfilled those texts. Uh, again, uh, another point that was made is that the virgin birth is a, a simple myth. Uh, and especially when we read the Proto-Evangelion, Yusuf mentioned Genesis chapter 3, 15 to 16, that that is not indicative necessarily of uh, Jesus the Messiah. I would beg to differ because when we read, for instance, Romans chapter 16, verse 20, when we read Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 to 10, we can see quite clearly that the uh, expectation is that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would be the fulfillment of the one that is to come. Uh, again, we also hear it said that there is definitely uh, a platonic understanding of God, uh, you know, uh, intervening into his creation. Uh, let, me, let me just say that this is thoroughly rebutted and, and reviewed. And uh, again, when we look at um, what is called the comp uh, composite fallacies of pagan religions, um, there's the assumption that if we lump uh, different perspectives together, they'll create the picture of what we see in the Gospels. That's thoroughly refuted and rebutted. There is no sound scholar today that will equate anything that we read of in the Gospels as being semi or even quasi-related to the myths of old or even some of the stories of the ancients. Uh, and so when we go on and on and on, we can see quite clearly that there is this expectation of the coming Messiah uh, and who he was. Uh, we heard it mentioned that when we look at the word uh, virgin, uh, that this is not something that is used. But I've shown quite clearly that uh, there's a Septuagint note. You can even go and look for yourself. That the word, uh, in actual fact, the Greek word uh, parthenos for virgin is, is something that, that is attested with and attested to, especially when it comes to the interpretation of Isaiah 7 verse 14. Um, th that is even known in pre-Christian Alexandria more than a hundred years before Jesus was even born uh, from the Jewish rabbis. And you can go have a look at what the rabbis said even about uh, a passage like Isaiah 53. In all of these, we see quite clearly that there was no confusion as to what the meaning was of the virgin, especially when it speaks of it in Isaiah chapter 7, 14. Uh, let me also just say in the last three minutes, uh, that when we look at the Quran's explication of the word Messiah, uh, when we look at, uh, and I think this is what me and um, Samuel try to get at, when we look at the way in which the New Testament lays that bare, when it speaks of Jesus being the Ho Christos or the anointed one, and uh, we can see that Ho Christos is connected emphatically. Um, and you can have a look at it. It's mentioned 350 times in the, uh, in the New Testament. Uh, it, it is connected to the suffering Messiah and, him being both the Son of God and the Suffering Messiah. Now, when we draw that back to the actual sinlessness of Jesus Christ, then it's time to go into that. But when we go to the virgin birth of Christ, uh, I think we try to say that when we read Matthew chapter 1, 20 to 21, uh, and its full account, remember it says in the latter part, it says his name will be Jesus and he will save his people from his sin. Um, we are not just saying that Jesus was the emphatic spokesperson of God, the Redeemer. We are saying he was the Redeemer. He was the Son of God. Uh, and Luke gets to that as well in Luke chapter 1, 31 to 35. Uh, in his account, he actually showed us exactly that this sinless perfection was afforded to Christ so that he could be the propitiation of our sins. So the question was given once more. Uh, why can God simply forgive sins and not just let it go? Uh, and, and he has to necessitate the death of Christ. Well, because God is just and God does not just oversee sin. There has to be a penalty for the sins which is expected and done. Uh, because of his holiness and his justice, there needs to be an appropriation and also an atonement. As we see in the Old Testament, we can see that the system is kept in check and we can see quite clearly what God demands is fulfilled in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. But that is done ultimately. And that's why the author of Hebrews says, now for once and for all, Jesus Christ became the propitiation for our sins and not just the sins of us, but also for the gentleman today. If you would accept him, he would become your portion, not because of ourselves, but because of God's essential purpose of the virgin birth, which is depicted in the scriptures, as we've seen, 
that is affirm, affirming Jesus both as Christ, but also the Savior. And that's what we see in the last few seconds. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Titus 2, verse 13. All of these passages right through the New Testament shows us that that was the purpose of the Messiah. He fulfills it, and we need to accept it in and from ourselves. So I'll leave you with that 11 seconds. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, uh, Rudolf. So that ends our time of rebuttals. Uh, we're going to move into a time of cross-examination now, which would be a 20-minute session in total. So we would start off. Um, I have noticed that uh, Yusuf has dropped out for now, um, but we can still go ahead. I think um, Shabir, I think Yusuf is just coming back in. So let me just let him in. So... Welcome back, uh, Yusuf. Um, we're about to start the cross-examination time where um, Shabir and Yusuf will be spending 10 minutes asking Rudolf and Samuel any particular questions they have. So over to you. Okay. Yusuf, do you want to start? Okay, let me start then because uh, I don't know if Yusuf can hear me to, to save the time. But let Dr. Shabir go ahead because my my I, I don't know if it's just my problem, but um, I, no, 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 no. I, I, I'd, I'd rather let you do it because I'm having connectivity problems here, and um, even when Rudolph was speaking, when I came back, it was very faint and and jumpy. So then the weather is pretty bad. So I, I'd let you go ahead, Dr. Shabir, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay, okay. Rudolf, uh, in, in your in your opening presentation, you said that Alma means someone un, un, untouched, and uh, probably you meant Parthenos at that time. Uh, and then later on, you said that Parthenos means uh, a virgin. So which one, of, uh, in your view, means uh, a virgin? Thanks for that, Doc. Yes. In Dr. Shabir? Can yes. you hear me? Sorry, can I go, or is Yusuf saying something? Hello, um, are we live? Are we clear? What, what's going on? Yeah, Yusuf, I can hear you, but apparently you didn't hear me. Um. Rudolf, just start. Sure, let me do it. Uh, okay, so when we look at the Septuagint, we can see quite clearly that the Septuagint uses the Greek word parthenos for virgin. Uh, though when we look at the understanding of what is given in, the, in some of the best translations of the word alma, uh, we can see quite clearly that even in the traditional Jewish commentaries, like, for instance, when we read Rashi, uh, in his commentary, for instance, on Songs of Solomon 1.3, he clearly and frankly explains this quite clearly that Alma means betrothed or even virgin or that which is chaste. So there's no disparity between the word Parthenos or the word Alma, especially when it comes into use for, from the Jewish commentaries and the Septuagint. Okay, so Rudolf, you, you, you know that if you uh, take that line of argumentation with the word Alma, then you're going against much of uh, scholarship. And, and moreover, um, uh, when it comes to Robert Miller's book that I've just mentioned, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but he argues that neither of these words, whether Alma or Betula or Parthenos, none of them actually meant virgin in the sense that we speak of a virgin nowadays it always meant a young woman of uh, marriageable age and um, you know um, it's maybe presumed that she's a virgin in our sense but but that's not the necessary meaning are you familiar with that book absolutely and that's why i mentioned in genesis 24 43 uh, where the the interpretation especially for amongst the jewish uh, rabbis and scholars when it speaks of, of uh, rebecca uh, it speaks in three terms, three general terms. They'll never really connect themselves to one explanation, but they'll say that the implication is of a chaste or an untouched person would be that we assume that they are a virgin. Um, and the same can be said, in, uh, I think also mentioned actually, uh, Exodus chapter 2, verse 8, that the young girl who, who, is un, who is chaste or even spoken of in those words or untouched is, is definitely a virgin. It would be somebody that is chaste. Especially okay. in the Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. So now let, let's say let's say we take that meaning as a possibility. Okay, she's a virgin at the time of the of this prophecy being uh, uttered. Then does, it doesn't necessarily mean that she will remain a virgin at the time of her actually conceiving the child. 
what if you're asking me for the physiology of of Mary's state uh, before and after the birth? Obviously, no, I'm not I'm asking about Mary. I'm asking about the the young woman in in Isaiah chapter seven verse fourteen. Like, what would the author of Isaiah have had in mind that this young woman that he's talking about would remain a virgin till the time of conception? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, and I don't think there's any disparity between that which Matthew tries to explicate when it comes to the virgin birth and what we see quite clearly explicated in Isaiah. Uh, obviously, we know that the virgin conception in the Gospel of Matthew is something unique, something special, and something done without a human counterpart, uh, that the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. Um, she asks the question to the angel, especially in Luke's Gospel, how will it be that I'll become pregnant because I've not known a man? Uh, which clearly tells us that she is a virgin. And then uh, obviously Jesus is conceived uh, via that means. But um, in, in Isaiah 7.14, obviously we, we know that there was no pre-existing virgins as far as we know that it conceived the baby uh, before uh, any form of coitus or, or sexual communion. Uh, but I, I definitely would say that in the New Testament, though, we see that there is the special distinction of the conception of Jesus without that interaction. Now, I want to pick up on something you just said, Rudolph, because I'm actually surprised that you put it that way, because I thought that most Christians would avoid putting it that way. You just said that the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. Is that what you said? Yeah, I wouldn't say artificially inseminated her. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is obviously God. Um, in the Quran, he's explicated as the, the breath of God. Uh, and therefore, what he created in her would be perceived as being a fetus or a baby. And you think it's and correct to say that he impregnated her? I would say it would be correct in saying that um, I think the right word would rather be conceived, um, but not in a physical sense, but in a creative uh, creator sense. Where okay, the so the Holy created. Spirit created Jesus then? What, what we see is, is that the scripture tells us quite clearly that the, it is what was birth is from is from the Holy Spirit. It's created from yeah. God. So, so I, want, I want to be clear because, Rudolf, you first said that the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. And when I asked you about it, you, you started to explain that it means creating. And now I'm asking you, did the Holy Spirit <laughs> impregnate Mary or did he create Jesus in Mary? Uh, well, I would say from a biological standpoint, yes. Mary was impregnated. That's, that's the way the physiology and biology works. But I would also say that uh, the Holy Spirit creates the fetus in the womb uh, as, as God, as an act of God. Okay, so um, this is the Holy Spirit acting as God, uh, because he is God according to your conception, and he created that flesh and blood that was developing in Mary, according sure. to you. Yes? According to the scriptures. According yes, okay. The... So then Muslims and Christians can agree that when we speak about the flesh and blood Jesus, this is a creature. Thank you. Well, I would, I would say that a fetus is a human person. Uh, I do not believe that a fetus is not a human being. I would believe. I, I, I would didn't believe ask that you that, though. I asked you, is this a creature? Because you just said that the Holy Spirit created this person in Mary. That this, this, uh, whatever was the other thing. Yes. So, so, so the, okay. So the flesh and blood aspect of Jesus. This is created. Well, uh, Jesus is encompassing two realities, and Christians have always believed this. We believe that there is. The reality of the infinite, uh, the transcendent infinitude, and the imminent finitude, which we would say is the body of Jesus, the person, the man Christ Jesus. Absolutely. Okay. So, so there is a man called Jesus, and and there is the Holy Spirit that created him, and and somehow dwells in him. True. After his birth, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Samuel, I have a question for you. Um, both you and Rudolf uh, mentioned that the Quran uh, accepts the, the virginal conception, uh, or you might say virgin birth. Um, now, um, you are, of course, um, familiar with the, with the idea of those who say uh, that when Isaiah 714 speaks of the young woman, even if we assume that she was a virgin at the time, then it could be that she got married later on and then conceived of the child, not while she's a virgin, but now as a married woman. 
Uh, you're familiar with that interpretation of, of Isaiah before we get to the Quran, yes. true? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is there any reason why that interpretation cannot apply to the Quran? Meaning that when the angel announces to Mary that you will have a child, uh, and she says, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? And the angel says, okay, uh, God creates what he wills. When he says to a thing, he only uh, gives the command and it happens. Uh, so um, does that preclude... Uh, the possibility that she uh, later on gets married and has a child in a normal way. Thank you. That, that, that's that's a helpful question. I would say that the Quran does preclude that because one, as the story unfolds of Mary, it doesn't say that she gets married, so it doesn't have that data. And then secondly, people, when she is pregnant, people are saying to her, I'm, I'm fairly correct, the Quran is saying this, that it records people saying to her, uh, you know, a daughter of, uh, a, a sister of Aaron, uh, you know, how come you're pregnant? You know, aren't you, uh, you know, you, you are not an unjust woman or something like that. I'm sorry, I'm just loosely paraphrasing. And so people are obviously asking her that question. And so I can't see how that would make sense if she'd got married and had children. Okay, so the Quran in Surah 19 says that she withdrew uh, to a far place, uh, to Makan and Sharqiyah, to an eastern place, uh, and that's where the angel approached her and said that I've come to give you a, um, a pure child. So could it be uh, that she went away from her people, she got married there, I'm just asking about a possibility, yeah, is yeah, it yeah, possible sure, sure. that she got married there, people don't know that she got married, she comes back with a child, and they're asking, well, okay. you know, where's the father of this child? Um, I mean, in one sense, I want to say yes, but I, I'd want to go back and check the text, you know, yeah. more carefully. Because the, the impression I've got is that they're asking her that because they assume that she's not married and that there's no information in the text saying that she was. I mean, if we wanted to say that hypothetically something may have happened when she went away... And that's not recorded in the Quran. Well, I mean, at that point, well, yes, you know, but we're in the land of hypotheticals there. So, sure. Okay, yeah. I'd like to defer to my colleague uh, Yusuf in case he would like to squeeze a question in. Yusuf, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, just, just quickly, um, the the because my my, my uh, I'm just getting cut off all the time. Just the point that was raised by Dr. Shabi, where. Samuel asked the rhetorical, well, he asked the question that the Quran raises where he says, O sister of Aaron, thy father was not a wicked man, nor was thy mother an unchaste woman, as reference to the idea that, look, how could she, being from a noble heritage and a pious woman, give birth to an illegitimate child, thereby referencing the idea of the virgin birth because the child was not born. But the point being made, many scholars have pointed out, and this it has been a possibility raised by, I think, the study Quran and the one that I've got in my hand here, is that that reference in Mary's bringing a strange thing, maybe to her having given birth to a son who claimed greater authority than the elders of Israel with a deeper hint to the calumny against her. But the word also signifies a forger of lies. Uh, and they continue in this by saying that it is remarkable that in his reply, Jesus does not make a single reference to the circumstance of his birth, because when she points to him, he says, I'm a messenger of God. So my question to you, Samuel, is that in the circumstances then, does the idea of, um, um, you know, questioning Mary and she pointing to Jesus, could that not be the fact that he was in fact claiming to have greater authority over the children of Israel? So therefore, the, the, the allegations to us, your father was not a bad person, your mother was not, uh, you know, wicked or lewd in any way. What have you brought before us? Could that not be a possibility as well? Samuel, you're on mute. It may be, and it seems that you're both wanting to not have a virgin conception here, and and that, that sounds, seems to be where you're coming from. Again, from my understanding of those verses, and, and I haven't prepared for that right now, it would seem yeah. to me that but, for, for, you know, cause, but I have read it, and the impression that I got was just, you know, how can you be pregnant? Sorry, how can you have a child when, you know, you, you don't come from a bad family? You know, again, you haven't got an illegitimate child. And so she, she doesn't explain it by saying, well, I I got married when I went away, or you know, yeah. that it, it doesn't seem to be talking about 
uh, his claim to re leadership relationships within Israel it just seems to be that she's got a child. So, yeah. Look well, well, I mean, his, his response doesn't, in fact, justify the virgin birth. But, but I want to move on just to because I know t I don't know what how many minutes. Are you familiar with the time. debate? Between yes, I okay. think we're out of time. Oh, okay. We've already gone okay. 30 minutes over the, okay. the first session on cross-examination. Right. I think we should turn it around now and have um, okay. Rudolf and Samuel ask sure. you the questions. So I'll um, hand over to you, Samuel and Rudolf. Um, yeah, I've got a question. Really I've got a question to get us started. Um, so Dr. Shabir was saying that there are some things that God can't do because I, I made the the comment that. It seems in Islam that God is locked out of his own creation. And I believe Dr. Shabir said, well, you know, there are some things that God just can't do. In Surah 75, verses 22 to 23, it speaks about the the believer having the blessing of seeing Allah on, 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 on the last day or however that time is understood. And so it seems there that Allah, and, and there are certainly hadiths which talk about you will see him as you see the sun. So how do you understand that? Because it seems to me that you're you're wanting to say Allah can't come and dwell in whatever way metaphysical understanding that might be. Um, yet it seems that the Quran says he he will be seen, will will be there. Okay. So so first of all I must remind you, uh Reverend, that um I pointed out to a contradiction in the Christian conception that Jesus is both perfect God and perfect man at the same time. I, I did not uh, classify as a contradiction those instances that you mentioned from the Old Testament where God appears to be a man. Uh, the contradiction occurs when you say that God was a man. Uh, so, so not so simply indwelling a man or appearing as a man, but that he was the man himself. Uh, so, uh, because he cannot be both uh, limited and unlimited at the same time. Now, uh, the eyes that we have in, in our physical uh, structures may be such that we cannot uh, uh, see God directly. But uh, in the life hereafter, with uh, the eyes of the spirit, we may be able to see God. And not only may be able to, as you mentioned from Surah 75, verses 23 onward, وَجُوهُنْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ nadira ila رَبِّهَا nadira. Uh, the, the faces will be shining, resplendent that day, and they will be looking at their uh, Lord. So uh, we pray for that beautific vision in the life hereafter. But it seems that our physical eyes, uh, just as uh, if we stare at the sun, it might be bad for our sight. Uh, if we, you know, look at God, who is the light of the heavens and the earth, that may be too much for us in, in this world. And God knows best. Sure. Uh, OK. And. I appreciate the point that you brought up that you're talking about the two um, that God actually taking to himself a human nature. And that'd be a great subject to have a debate to properly go through that. I guess my point is simply that th there is an entering into creation in whatever way it is. And so the incarnation may, may be a different expression of it, but it's still an expression of God coming in and revealing himself even if it's in the, the hereafter, it's still creation. It's not that we cease to be created. You know, so it, it will be seeing God in creation. Reverend, you seem to be answering a straw man. I've already clarified that I'm not uh, denying the possibility uh, that God could appear as a human uh, being. I'm, I'm not, I have not denied that possibility, neither have I affirmed it. Uh, but I have denied uh, the, the uh, possibility that Jesus was both God and man at the same time, because I see that that in, in, involves an inherent contradiction. So, so you're going back and saying, oh, but Shabir, uh, you know, you're not denying uh, that, you know, God can come into his creation. Uh, and that's what we affirm. No, you affirm more than this. Um, so they, you, you cannot water it down to the thing which I already agree is, is a logical possibility. Uh, what I'm saying is that the Christian doctrine involves a logical impossibility. And, and that's the one that I, that I deny is a fact. Okay. Well, as I said, that'd be one to explore because that there's a whole range of things we need to do there. Uh, Rudolph, do you have a, a question? Yes, I think it's a pretty straight up one. Um, if I read the debate correctly, why deny the virgin birth? I, I, I just don't understand that something that is, that is for me affirmed in the Quran is suddenly denied in the Christian scriptures. Uh, yeah. I know Muslim scholars uh, that would definitely, I've got 
a plethora of uh, Muslim scholars on my right you know, on my left that affirms the virgin birth. Why is yes. there denial yeah. of, of these guys? Because these guys are thrown under the bus as well. If I look at Mustafa Akhyol and all of these guys, they affirm the virgin birth as it is laid out in the Christian text. I would yes. say that they void that meaning, but why do you guys deny it? Okay, so, so Rudolf, I, I have not denied the virgin uh, birth. Uh, however, in explicating the Quran, we have to be careful about what the Quran says and also be careful about what it does not say. And we have to stop where the Quran stops and not attribute to, to the Quran or to God something he did not actually say. Now, the Quran, the way it puts the story uh, on the surface level, it looks like the Quran is uh, going along with the story as it is, especially in the Gospel of, of Luke. Um, with the uh, clarification that it is God who creates this child in, in the womb of Mary. And uh, that is commonly understood by Muslims to affirm the virginal conception. And Muslims uh, to this day respectfully refer to Mary as Maryam al Azra, Mary the Virgin. And I have no difficulty referring to her as such. Um, uh, but to say that the Quran... Uh, is, uh, depicts this as a virginal conception. This is to attribute to the Quran something is not that is not clearly in the Quran. And just as some people have interpreted Isaiah uh, to mean that at the time of the Annunciation, at the time of the prophecy in Isaiah, uh, the the young woman uh, could have been a virgin. But then later on, she could get married and have a child by natural means. In a similar way, it seems to me possible that in the Quranic story, at the time when Mary receives the Annunciation, she is a virgin. Uh, and she asks, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? And she's told, OK, when God decrees a thing, he only says to it, be and it is. But when God decrees a thing and he says to it, be and it is, it, it, a natural process can follow. Just as God tells us in the Quran, he gives us the rain. But there is the process of rain, and God describes that process in the Quran as well. The winds blow, gathering up the moisture, forming clouds. The clouds become heavy. The rains fall. So that's the process that's described in the Quran. And yet, in a single sentence, the Quran can say, God sends down the rain. So saying that God sends down the rain does not deny the process, the natural process by which he does it. Saying that God creates this child in Mary's womb does not deny the, the process by which a child is born. In fact, even Yusuf and me, we will say that God gave us the children that we have. And I believe that Christians say that too, even though we know the process and we apply the process. Could I add one thing to that, Rudolf, or do you want to go on? Because I need to clarify my position as well on that issue. Um, just one thing is that we're not... Yes, okay. Yeah, I'm not, de I'm not denying the aspect of the virgin birth as such, but what I find quite strange is that if you look at the position that Samuel adopts, Samuel, for example, took liberty on the text of the Quran when it came to the crucifixion, where you've got a categorical statement of denial, and he says it's not basically denying. But when, the, when it comes to the virgin birth, because it does not uh, conform to the belief, denying it would not conform to Christian belief, he then maintains the idea that the virgin birth is basically announced in the Quran. Once again, whilst we have no problem affirming it, the, the problem in Surah 3 verse 42 is that only the espousal had yet been decided because, you know, she had not been informed when she was given the good news of the, she was told in, in uh, of, the, of the child, she was told by the angel, you know, even so the child will be born by God, and that could also mean bringing about the circumstances which result in the birth of a child. So, for example, there's nothing in the text of the Quran which which can lead one necessarily. I'm not saying all by, by compulsion, but necessarily to the idea that um, the child would be conceived outside of the ordinary cause of children of nature for that particular matter. And I think in the study Quran, the translation that I've got here and the study Quran, they allude to this possibility as well. So I think, you know, there, there is a, a tradition in terms of the virginal birth in both Christianity and Islam, but the texts themselves are not that emphatic. And we can make the same argument for the Quran as we can, for example, make for the New Testament when Matthew takes liberty of the text by using a translation translation to substantiate the biblical basis for the virgin birth. The text in the Hebrew doesn't actually say that. It says a young woman, if you were to look at the pure Hebrew text and not Betula. And so that, that would be my response in relation to that. Okay. Yeah. Maybe a last question. Uh, Rudolph? Do we, have, we have time, Dave. Sorry, Dave, you muted. 
So yeah. we have one more minute to go. Yeah. One more minute. How will Muslims give light to Allah being close to us if he does not indwell his creation? Um, I don't know if it makes sense, but how is there any form of intimacy or knowledge of Allah if he does not communicate himself via the created order? And I know you would say the Quran, but I'm talking about actually, not just scribally. Uh, is there anything beyond the Quran that we can assume or assess about Allah? So, so Rudolf, I, I'm not sure I understood your question because I, I, your question started out by asking, um, it, like it was based on the premise that we are saying that Allah does not, cannot indwell his creation. And then there was something about communicating through the created order. So are there two separate questions here? No, I, I would say it's pretty much similar in, in the sense that if we can assume anything of Allah, whatever is assumed in the created order, is that with us, that innovation, or is that something that we can take in fact? Well, we can um, take, yeah. Okay, uh, Yusuf, did you want to take a stab at that? No, no, I think take, take it over, Dr. Shabir, yeah, because so, I'm, I'm getting problems with my hearing. Yeah, so I would say that God is communicating with us in so many different ways, through his holy scriptures, uh, through inspiration into the human mind, uh, through angelic inspiration into the human mind, uh, so many mysteries. Um, uh, but that does not mean that, that God has become a man. Uh, and, and we have seen the difficulties with, with you're trying to conceptualize and to put into words what you mean by, by the Holy Spirit um, you know, either impregnating uh, Mary or creating Jesus within Mary and what that means for Jesus's uh, divinity. So uh, Islam, to me, has cleared our minds of any of these uh, problems and re uh, kept us uh, upon a pure monotheism in which there is God and everything else. And, and, and there's only one God uh, and uh, all else are his uh, creation. Uh, so that for Muslims is uh, is very simple. But there's not something actual that is actually communicated in the creator order of Allah. Uh, like Christians would assume that there's a, uh, there's a reality revealed in Christ of that transcendent infinitude, which is God with us. That is not in Islam. Well, in Islam, we understand that we human beings have something of God. Uh, you know, God breathed into Adam something of his spirit, and human beings have something of that, whether it's the intellect, it's the human volition towards good, uh, and inclination towards good, the fitra on which God has created us, and uh, our attempts to imitate God. Uh, all of this uh, is a, a reflection of uh, God's character and, and goodness. Uh, but is, is it the limitation that we do not have a, an inherent contradiction where God is man and, and God at the same time in one being? Um, I don't see that as a limitation at all. No, we would say that there is definitely a contradiction if we say the same thing at the same time, that Jesus is a blend of both the physical and the supernatural, but he's not. There is definitely a separation, but I think that thumbs up. I think... Uh... Time is up uh, on the cross-examination time. Let's move into the closing statements. So we'll start off with Yusuf. Yusuf, you'll have um, three minutes for your closing statement. Thanks. Okay. Can, can, can you time me um, and just give, give me an indication with one minute because um, I've been losing you um, and then the, voc the, the, well, the auditory sign is not too good. So just give me an indication uh, when, when it's one minute up. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. All right. So I'm just starting now. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I'm sorry I was not part of the entire session, but I really appreciate the discussion and the conversation. I do understand that next week is Christmas, and um, I have no problem as a Muslim um, in, in wishing our Christian friends, I know some Muslims may, but I have no problem in wishing our Christian friends a Merry Christmas. We hope they have a good time on this festive season. I may also add that my wife, is uh, her grandparents are down, and she's getting them a Christmas tree. So uh, we, we don't have a problem with, in fact, um, celebrating the festivities of Christmas. We don't commemorate it. And I think the point being made is that the Quran does not accept Jesus uh, as having been born on the 25th of December. And I think history itself doesn't accept Jesus as having been born on the 25th of December. It was um, the time when fresh ripe dates are found on the palm trees. And it's now a recognized fact that 25th of December is not Jesus' birthday. Bishop Barnes, for example, in his book, The Rise of Christianity, he says, 
there is more of a no authority for the belief that 25 December was the actual birthday of Jesus. If we can give any credence to the birth story of Luke with the shepherds keeping watch in the field near Bethlehem. The birth of Jesus did not take place in winter when the night temperature is so low in the hill country of Judea that snow is not not uncommon. And Bishop Barnes then goes on to relate that the 25th of December was taken from the Persian cult Mithra being the god of the invisible sun. The festal day was suitably that in which after the winter salt uh, styes, the sun again began clearly to show his strength. Now, I'm not saying that Christians are commemorating pagan festival, but the point being made is that this was somehow or the other adopted. The idea where the, the winter solstice and the sun begins to show and the festivities of the of Mithra, that was later adopted by the Roman church and, of course, made to then celebrate the birth of Christ. So I think that historical point of view we obviously are aware of, but at the same time, uh, we wish our Christian friends um, well over this particular season. Um, the, regarding the issue of the Messiah, I, I meant that it is indeed special. It's a special de designation. I didn't say it was ordinary, but the issue is that the Messiah was never viewed as God in any given sense, never at any stage. And the point being made in relation to the atonement was that sin cannot be erased by the mere observance of the technical rite of blood sacrifice. So if, for example, the penitent sinner must perceive the sacrifice as though he were the offering himself, uh, the, the, the true atonement itself, the sinner has to at the same time face the gravity of the guilt and he has to act to relieve his burden and to basically um, make sincere repentance. How is that possible if Jesus came and in fact died for the sins of the world? Uh, that that whole notion uh, basically minute, uh, you know, becomes a fallacy. Ezekiel 18.20 still stands. That was never addressed. The soul that sins shall die, but the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. That basically principle has never been refuted. It remains eternal. Isaiah, uh, at no time was Isaiah 7.14 ever considered by Jewish sources to mean that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. As I mentioned, the debate between Justin Martyr and Trifle over the meaning and the interpretation of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, as late as the 2nd century, Trifo, the Jew took the position that Alma means a young woman and that the promised child was indeed Hezekiah. So clearly this is not a thought out idea. Um, lastly, um, Rudolph makes mention of Job chapter 19, verse 25. But Job basically states the Redeemer, My, I know that my Redeemer lived. And are we to say that Job for that particular matter believed that this Redeemer was some sort of God man or a theophany or God incarnate coming to down to earth? Did he have that concept or did he have a concept of a singular being, an absolute being, Yahweh, who was not man, who was not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it was one and only God that they basically existed. So in a nutshell, I think at the end of the day, what we need to do as Christians, as Muslims, as Jews, we need to take the principles and the spirit of our prophets in terms of what they taught and make lived reality and a change in our world today. I mean, we see hunger, we see poverty, we see a sense of deprivation, we see oppression. What would Jesus, what would Muhammad, what would Moses do if they were here today in our world? Would they be with our world leaders or would they be in the barrios and the favelas and the squatter camps and helping liberating the orphans and the widows and the needy and providing some sense of um, liberation, not only on a physical level, but even on a spiritual level. That's how we reenact the uh, spirit of these great prophets of God, these mighty men of God. And for 2023, I wish all of you well, and I hope we can all come together as brothers and sisters in humanity and make the world a lived uh, and a better place for all of us. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Yusuf. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to you, Rudolf, who will have three minutes for your closing statement. Well, thank you so much. This is always such an uh, engaging topic and definitely something that is dear to Christians, especially over this period of time uh, where we recognize and see quite clearly that that which was foretold is fulfilled in the coming of the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. But let me just start off and say that that is exactly what we try to show today. We try to show that due to the birth uh, of this one Savior, uh, which would be known as God with us, uh, we can now in, experience that intimacy with God, that reconciliation with God, and that conceptual understanding that the one that is speaking to us, coming to us, showing us uh, the absolute nature of God, that we are favored, we can pursue God, we are accepted by him, and we are accepted to the degree that he dwells with us and ultimately dwells within us. That is exactly what I was trying to show you in my outline. I tried to show quite clearly that Jesus was definitely God with us. Uh, and uh, it's uh, quite fascinating that we see that there are numerous instances that I mentioned 
uh, that Jesus is showing quite clearly and giving us a glimpse, not just of the authority of the Father or God, but that he is explicitly and implicitly seen as God. I mentioned quite clearly uh, the fact that uh, Jesus forgives the sin of his people, which is mentioned in Matthew chapter 9, verse 2. Uh, we see quite clearly that he announces his deity to the high priest when the high priest announced or even demands a sign in Matthew 26, verse 63, um, and then to six, uh, verse 64, uh, where we can clearly see that Jesus is setting out to prove exactly who he was. I mentioned Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, uh, where the tempter tempted, uh, tempted Jesus, and in Matthew chapter 4, 67, uh, and tempts him, and Jesus says, you shall not tempt the the Lord your God, and he flees from Christ. That specialness of Jesus is exemplified by the author, Matthew. Um, also, his disciples, I mentioned in my opening statement, Matthew 16, 15 to 17, where Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say I am? Uh, and he announced the very fact, Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Uh, I showed quite clearly that Jesus was worshipped in the highest sense in Matthew chapter 14, 22 to 33. Jesus commands angels after his death, even and his resurrection. Matthew 27, 54, uh, we can see that he's announced as truly being the son of God. Uh, we see that he'll judge angels. Uh, he'll command angels in Matthew 13, 41, 42. Uh, we can go on and on and on. I mentioned Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of the temple. He speaks of the temple as his own house. Um, Jesus is the one that judges all nations. Uh, we can see that uh, in turn, and we can see that emphatically. All I'm trying to say is that I think Jesus is worth our consideration. And I think Matthew, as a Jew, shows us the fulfillment of that which is predicted in, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And therefore, we can believe that the Jews believed it as well very early on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rudolf. Let's move into the... Final closing statements of so four minutes each, and we'll start with Dr. Shabir. Well, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, friends, I'm so glad we did this dialogue today. And uh, a young man uh, asked me, why are we doing another one? And uh, I said to him, it's a continuing conversation. People are very uh, firm in their beliefs, and they will not uh, change their beliefs overnight. But we keep um, hoping to um, understand the issues better and to help our friends to understand the issues better. Ladies and gentlemen, in the uh, Q&A, um, um, uh, Rudolf uh, said that the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. When I asked him for clarification, he said the Holy Spirit created the child in Mary. And uh, then it seemed to me that it was difficult for him to explicate how Jesus could be God if the Holy Spirit is uh, creating him. Um, I, I, and I had asked uh, for someone to defend Matthew as a monotheist, but so far our Christian friends have not uh, defended him. The problem is this. If you interpret Matthew as presenting Jesus as God, uh, but he is the son of God, according to Matthew, uh, and his father is God, then clearly you have in Matthew two who are called God. Now, for Christians, we, this is all reconciled in the doctrine of the Trinity. There are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, and the three uh, are one God. But you, you cannot um, assume that Matthew had this reconciliation in his own mind. In fact, we don't have a statement in Matthew's gospel at all saying that there is only one God. Uh, and so we don't even know if Matthew was a monotheist. And in fact, nobody knows who Matthew really was. And uh, in further defense of that, uh, Rudolf quoted Hebrews. But in Hebrews also, we don't know that there is only one God. And who is this Hebrews author? So we don't. So one unknown, unknown author is called to defend the other unknown author. And neither of them can be proved to be a monotheist. And our Christian friends are then left with a doctrine which to Muslims uh, appears to be a tritheistic uh, doctrine or at least bordering on that. Notice that Rudolf uh, gives many uh, evidences from the Bible showing that Jesus is the Son of God or Jesus is God dwelling in us or Jesus is God with us. But not a single one that would say clearly and emphatically in a simple declarative statement that Jesus is God. He kept saying that Jesus revealed himself, but he is... Uh, when he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And they said, son of the living God. So he praised that. Okay, so that means he's the son of God. So someone is called God and someone else is called his son. 
It's not God A and God B. It's not the first person of the Holy Trinity and the second person of the Holy Trinity. One is God and the other one is called something else, either his son or the Messiah or something else. So do that. Uh, start with that. I'm not saying that this is a Muslim belief, uh, but but at least start with that. Be faithful to your scriptures, my friends. You say that Jesus forgives sins in Matthew 9, but then you look at the passage in 19, Matthew 9, and Matthew concludes himself by saying that uh, the people praise God who has given such authority to men, which means that in Matthew's view, Jesus is one of the men who got this kind of authority to declare the forgiveness of sins here on earth. And so, so listen to your own scripture, my friend, and you will see that Jesus is not the Almighty God. Now, what about Jesus dying for the sins? As Yusuf said, nobody has really clarified how the, the Christian doctrine of atonement gels with Ezekiel chapter 18, where it clearly says that the, you know, the, the righteous will not pay for the sins of the guilty. Uh, each one will pay for his own sins. Uh, so how do we have a doctrine which makes it look like God is penalizing the innocent in order to let the guilty go free? And yet we know that Christians believe in their own suffering and the necessity of their own suffering. So if Jesus suffered once and for all for everyone, why would our Christian friends continue to suffer as well? Clearly something is wrong and the solution is Islam. Thank you all so much. Uh, let's do this again. Let's continue the conversation. Thanks very much, Dr. Shabir. Uh, we'll conclude with uh, Samuel's uh, four-minute closing statement. Thanks, Samuel. I think that with all of our debates that we've had in this group, um, this has been the one with the least number of concluding statements. The, the mm -hmm. debate has continued. Um, and so I feel I need to at least spend a minute answering these. Uh, in terms of the Trinity, God is a higher order personal being. If you use yourself and a human experience to understand the person of nature of God, which it seems that's what Muslims do, then of course you're not going to understand what God has revealed of himself. In terms of Ezekiel 18 not having been answered, I answered it in my presentation and in my rebuttal. Read Ezekiel 13, Ezekiel 16, where it says that God will provide the sacrifice of atonement. So Ezekiel 18 in no way takes away the concept of atonement. It adds to the atonement that we need to have, we need to, we are personally responsible to repent and turn to God and he will provide the sacrifice of atonement. So I did answer that. Um, I'm just going to get back now to, to, to give a concluding statement. I want to thank uh, everyone for watching today. I hope you found it helpful and have been able to uh, go further on your uh, on your own thinking in this regard. And Christmas is a, a great area for us to really think about because it's a, a time in Jesus' life where the aspects of the gospel are really clear. Uh, it's one of the, the many places on the Christian, uh, the Christian calendar where we celebrate things. We celebrate Easter. We celebrate uh, many different things in the traditional calendar. And they've been spread out over the years uh, over the, the course of a year is to celebrate different things and have it taught. Um, now, as I pointed out, the, the, the gospel message that we learn in Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 to 25, is that we are dead in our sins. Uh, it's very clear there. And that is what the rest of the prophets before Jesus said. And they demonstrate that humanity is unable to save itself and that we face the wrath of God. And that's repeated again and again and again. And there is never any human who is able to, to solve this. And so we're given many examples of righteous humans, but none of them can solve the problem of sin and death. And so what we read, and I gave examples from Malachi, Ezekiel, and Isaiah, that God says he is going to come and do what we cannot do, and that God is going to come and save us. Now, if you reject that Jesus is uh, Emmanuel, God with us, then you have a story in the gospel where there is an individual who lives the sinless life and there is an individual who, who, who can do it. There is someone who can live without sin. Now, that is so far away from the earlier prophets uh, because what, what you're in effect saying is that Jesus is the time when humanity finally saves itself. 
That's what you're left with. This is what the early church fathers spoke about. This is why when, uh, when we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus is God come to us to do what we have failed to do. That's just what the story is. We've been, uh, Dr. Shabir encouraged us to read our scriptures. That's what I'm doing. I'm saying read them. Uh, if, you, if you don't see Jesus as God for other reasons, you end up with humanity saving itself. And so just to finish up with this Christmas, I hope everyone has a, a good holiday period and a good Christmas. And again, I just want to encourage if you're a Christian or a Muslim to go and read the gospel afresh, to read the Christmas story yourself. Again, I've said, please uh, start with Matthew. The, the gospel is recorded by Matthew. And uh, you, you can read about Jesus like for yourself and you can um, hear from the scriptures and let God speak to you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Samuel. And uh, let me take this opportunity to thank each of our speakers today for uh, their participation in the Christmas special and, of course, for the uh, respectful tone of the discussions throughout. So let me start. Uh, Dr. Shabir, just thank you once again for all your preparation and participation today. And thank you, Dave, for so excellently hosting and uh, keeping everything in control. Mm -hmm. And you've been the most excellent host. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Reverend Samuel, um, once again, um, for all your preparation and your time. Thanks so much for uh, participating today. It's great to be with everyone. Thank you. And uh, Yusuf, thank you so much for your participation and also for uh, uh, persevering through all the technical issues um, on your side there. Thank you, David. You've been, as Shabir says, an excellent moderator. I think you and Rudolph have been two of my favorite moderators in debates <laughs> <laughs> that I've had in the past. So thank you. It's been great. No, it's, it's, it's been an absolute delight to moderate today. Um, and also, Rudolph, thank you so much for, uh, for your preparation and for your time. And I know that you also had one or two uh, technical glitches along the way. No, my absolute pleasure, Dave. And thank you so much to these guys. Thank you, Shabir, Yusuf, mm -hmm. and Samuel as well. Uh, it's wonderful to have this conversation with you guys. And let me let me end by also just thanking everyone who joined us online. A big thank you to you. And we look forward to future conversational debates of this nature. Um, so wherever you are in the world, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Take care. Good to be with you, gentlemen. Let's do good, it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm.